Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our tutorial session of uh, reverse engineering of deceptions, right? Um, it's our great pleasure to talk about this concept, uh, some main technical approaches, and uh, some recent applications. And this tutorial will be jointly given by uh, me. Uh, I'm CJ Liu from Michigan State University, as well as uh, Dr. Xiaoming Liu uh, from Michigan State University, as well as uh, uh, Xue Lin uh, from uh, Northeastern Universities. And um, before we start our tutorial, I would like to give my uh, a grateful uh, thanks to DAPA who uh, support um, this is a whole project and, and our studies in the past uh, uh, two years. Okay, um, let me give a quick outline and I'm trying to get you about how this tutorial looks like. So at the beginning, we will spend some time to talk about what is a rat. So uh, what is, how to define uh, reverse engineering of deceptions and why we need to consider this concept. This is actually a pretty new concept uh, through the lens of the adversarial machine learning. And sometimes we talk about adversarial type, adversarial defense, for example, uh, adversarial detection and robust training, but reverse engineering is a new aspect to understand the data model influence uh, through the lens of the adversarial machine learning, okay? And then the part one will be given by our daughter Xueling. Uh, she will talk about how to reverse engineer, how to infer, how to estimate adversarial perturbations from the adversarial examples only. So you only have adversarial examples. Adversarial examples means adversarial attacks trying to fool machine learning models. So you can think about this as a one type of machine centric attacks. We want to generate some attack instances to fool machine learning like deep neural network decisions. And then uh, the second part, I will talk about um, some um, more in-depth understandings of the right and for machine central attacks, which include both adversarial attacks as well as uh, the backdoor uh, training phase attacks. And the part three will be given by uh, Dr. Xiaoming Liu. Um, he will talk about right uh, from the perspective of human central attacks. You can think about as the deep fixed images. Um, the images are generated from some generative models and the goal is trying to fool human wheels instead of machine learning systems. And uh, eventually we will conclude this tutorial and give some open questions and, and, and we are also open for a discussion as well. And I would like to thank our students uh, who made this uh, slides, um, who help us to organize this event as well. Okay. Uh, the first question, actually the core concept in this tutorial is what is the right? What is reverse engineer of deceptions? So generally speaking, this is, just, um, this is a plain text, but I will give you some examples later. So generally speaking, is given some attack instance, um, like I will example, uh, backdoor attack, uh, the GAN generated, the diffusion model generated images. Can we reverse engineer or infer some fun green adversarial knowledge? like attack tools, um, like attack goals, so on and so forth, beyond the ordinary adversarial detection or defense techniques. So in other words, we want to understand um, how this uh, attack looks like. So um, which part, if we were thinking about adversarial image, which part is attacks trying to attack on top of this image? This is, a, you can think about as a attribution of the adversarial examples. So um, to understand the knowledge behind adversarial attack instance will help us to further develop the new defense techniques and also trying to help us to build up accessibility for the adversarial machine learning. So this is why this is a very important concept and we want to uh, introduce this concept through this tutorial. So here is the examples. Uh, let's just take the uh, generative models as examples. Um, we can use the generative models to generate many fake images, right? And the basic question people are trying to answer uh, in the community is whether or not uh, okay, um, you can uh, detect this image is fake or real, right? This is a um, um, image detection problem, and this is a quite popular problem. However, if we take one um, more step forward. So whether or not you can give some knowledge beyond that detection problem. For example, can you tell us whether or not these two images from generated from the same model, same generative model, yes or no? And what's the origins of the generative models used to generate those fake images? That's one example. You can think about that as an attribution problem. 
And the second example is suppose um, this is an image is generated from the generative model. Can you tell me some signatures about this generative models? Like how the model architecture looks like, which guy, and what header parameter used to train this guy, this as examples. So this is you can think about as a model parking problem. You're trying to infer some fine green details about the generative model used to generate this attack instance. So this is what we call model pathing problem, which also belongs to the scope of right reverse engineering of deceptions. So through these examples, I'm trying to emphasize that what's the right? Right basically saying, can we infer adversarial attribution and even finer adversarial info, uh, 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 knowledge from the attack instances? So this is uh, uh, from the genetic model perspective, but later on you will see also we have some uh, adversarial examples uh, cases as well. So why is it significant? Why um, 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 our group and, and, and like um, DAPA cares about this is a concept? So let me give you, a, a, this is a formal program into, uh, introduction. This is a DAPA red program, um, rewards engineering of deceptions. And this is this program trying to do the exact same thing as I mentioned. We want to understand what attack two chains hidden from the adversarial attack, uh, from adversarial attacks, as well as uh, human central attacks, like uh, things that are images. And but this program is also built up on top of uh, some other trustworthy AI projects um, from DAPA. This is a guard, it's one example. And uh, uh, how to guarantee robustness of AI uh, against the deceptions. And this is another example, this is from NSF. It's called Safe Learning Enable Systems. It actually has two calls uh, this year. Uh, the deadline was well, the first deadline just passed, and we there's another deadline coming. But the whole concept is similar. We are trying to build up a trustworthy and safe um, uh, machine learning and AI systems. And just to finish, in the last week, there's an AI forward meeting organized by DARPA and the uh, AI Force. Uh, NSF, um, we, uh, they are trying to understand the same thing. They are trying to uh, re-imagine uh, the future of AI for national security. And trustworthy AI, and including this is a reverse engineer of deception concepts uh, uh, were also highlighted uh, uh, in that meeting as well. So from this is the funding agencies, I just want to give you a, a general sense about that. This is a, this is a um, concept, right? It's important and it comes from um, 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 the funding agencies as well. So that's why um, um, we are happy to share our some um, recent uh, uh, works as well as the works from the other colleagues um, uh, who contribute to this field. Okay. Um, so before uh, diving into um, the right techniques, let us first talk about what adversary, what adversaries we will be focused on um, in this tutorial. So um, we uh, generally divide the, the types of adversaries we will consider into two types. The first type is machine centric attack. The basic thing, um, the attack instance are trying to fool the decision machine learning model, testing phase, prediction, evasion, and also examples. Or training phase, they are poisoning by all backdoor attacks. So they are all trying to make something, either at the testing phase or training phase, trying to fool. Uh, machine learning models. Um, and these examples, um, um, these pipelines, uh, we, you will see later as well, but this basically in, uh, includes all the machine central att uh, attacks we will consider in this talk. So we have the training phase, uh, we generate, or we, we collect the training data, and then we train the model, and, uh, and we deploy the model at the testing phase, we make a decision. And we will consider two types of attacks, as I mentioned earlier. The first one is adversarial examples or attacks. That means model has been trained. Okay, we deploy the model already. And we generate some adversarial noise at a test input. And then using the perturbed test input to fool the trained model's decision. So this happened at the inference phase, post the training. And the second type of attacks we will consider, and we will consider for RED is uh, backdoor attacks or charging attacks. So this means you're trying to poison your training data set. You inject some additional noise in the training set. And then using this poison training set to train the model. And then the learn models will exhibit some poison behavior. Um, 
Again, I will introduce uh, more details later. But this, the fourth family of adversaries we will focus on is called machine central attacks because the goal is trying to fool machine learning models. Okay. And the second family of adversaries we will consider is human central attacks. Here, the, attack, the, the goal of the attack is trying to generate or modify images with the intention of deceiving or manipulating human viewers. So this is a, a deep fixed images as one example. We generate images which look realistic, but uh, for humans, but actually they are fake images. Okay, so this is what we call a uh, human central attacks. We will talk about how to reverse engineer human central attacks as well in this tutorial. Okay. So uh, let me give you more details about this uh, two attack families. Um, uh, in case uh, someone are not well familiar about the machine central attacks and the human central attacks. Okay. So um, this examples basically shows adversarial example. So you have some um, benign or clean input, which is uh, the, if you use a model, um, which is uh, like resident 18, it will predict uh, this image as outstretch. This is it's a quite a decision. However, if you're adding some very small perturbations, um, they are not random, uh, they are carefully designed, which is called adversarial perturbations. And now you generate some perturbed images, which looks very similar to the original image, but this image can fool models decision. So this is called adversarial example. This is a very well-known concept so far on the since 2017. Um, and this adversarial example, adversarial attacks actually um, 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 also occur in the physical world. Um, this is a uh, stop sign um, um, uh, is uh, one of the examples. You, gener you generate some stickers. And now you put the stickers on the stop sign. And the locations and the patterns could be um, uh, carefully designed. And then once you use that, you, you just test the, um, the existing deep neural network based autopilot systems, you will find that. This is stop sign. After those um, uh, perturbations, which is adding stickers on top of that, then this stop sign will be recognized by the speed limit sign. So this is actually uh, real world examples um, and, 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 and revealed by researchers. Uh, in the autonomous driving, as well as uh, out of some machine learning communities. And I also want to show another examples, which we uh, developed, which we call Adversal T-shirt. So this is, a, um, oops, there's a videos that you can, whether you can watch it or not. Okay, uh, sorry about that, but you cannot watch it now. Uh, hopefully I will, uh, uh, play it uh, during the uh, breaking time. But the idea is of the adversarial t-shirt is we generate some patterns and we print on the t-shirt. And even the human is working, there are some um, um, transformations on the uh, on this clothes uh, because this is a non-rigid object. And even that happened, but this adversarial pattern can be still very strong uh, to fool the object detectors. Um, the, 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 the persons who wear this t-shirt, you can see the colorful patterns uh, can bypass the object detection. So that's uh, that's what we call that as a t-shirt. There's a video for that, um, unfortunately it cannot uh, uh, play here. And um, the second um, machine central attacks, as I mentioned earlier, is a backdoor attacks. Um, the backdoor attacks means you try to poison a part of the training data and how to poison. Um, and, and that means, um, this actually means uh, the backdoor uh, attack. So for example, you can generate some triggers. The triggers is called backdoor trigger or Trojan trigger with some uh, fixed pattern. Uh, with some fixed pattern, as you can see, we're adding some square uh, at the bottom of the image. And then we, 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 we combine this pattern uh, with any other uh, training data. Uh, but it could be just a small subset of training data. And now we mislabel uh, those uh, training data with that pattern. So like eight plus square, seven plus square becomes uh, label four. So this is basically saying you have to manipulate the two things. One is the image pattern as well as image label. So this is called a label corrupted backdoor attack. And once you create such a modified data set, really called a poison data set, now you train the model. And the learned model, um, surprisingly, will give you two outcomes. The first outcome is, if we, you test these models using some clean input, the um, benign input without a such trigger pattern, then the decision will be correct 
um, the behaves uh, normally. However, if you um, present this trigger on test time input as well, then this trigger will trick. Um, this is a learner model, make an incorrect decision. Um, it will give you the target label four because here you mislabel those images with label four in the training side. So this is called uh, backdoor attacks. So as I mentioned, there's a two key uh, components here. The first one is the backdoor trigger injection. You have to uh, manipulate the training set in some ways. And then sometimes you, can, you, you don't need to mislabel the training data for those uh, Trojan, uh, for the Trojan points, but um, um, uh, the, in the basic backdoor setup, you have to mislabel the training data. Uh, for those data with those backdoor triggers. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the second thing is um, once the model is trained, you, if you want to evaluate the model's performance in terms of the backdoor possibility, you have to use uh, the test time input plus the same trigger uh, to trick this backdoor behavior. The backdoor behavior means the prediction towards a target label for. But if the trigger is not present at a test time, then this is a back, this is a poison model. This is a backdoor model will behave uh, normal as the uh, model learned without any um, poison data uh, poison data in the training set. So this is called backdoor attacks. So we will also consider backdoor attacks and talk about how to reverse engineer of backdoor attack. For example, once you give me the trained model, can we reverse engineer about this trigger? So that's a one reverse engineer problem. And if possible, that could be very useful, right? Because we will understand, okay, uh, which part is wrong in the training side. And another um, preliminary um, we will consider is the human centric attacks. Uh, so um, Xiaoming will uh, talk more details uh, later, but here, let me give you uh, some um, basic background. And the key uh, component uh, to um, in trait, the human central attacks is using a generative models like down or diffuse models to synthesize realistic and convincing images to, to full human wheels. There's many choices uh, so far for the generative models. Therefore, one question we want to understand is, given the defix images, uh, which model trying to generate that image? That's a reverse engineering problem. And also, um, we also see many uh, applications using generative models, image editing is one of them. So for example, image editing uh, could enable various militia modifications with the malicious intent. We just uh, replace this is uh, a person with another person and uh, release this is uh, thin type images online. Now it will cause some issues, right? So um, if we consider from the reverse engineering perspective, the RED problem can be considered as, can we identify which part of images are manipulated? That kind of manipulation localization problem, right? That's also a red problem. So we will also talk about that later. Uh, now, let me give you some motivating examples of the, uh, of the right. Um, um, we will talk about this example, so applications uh, in details later, but. At the introduction part, I would like to I, I, I would like to think about, and in what scenario red could be very useful. So the four things I want to um, give you a favor about um, red for the adversarial attacks, which is the machine central attacks, right? So if we can develop this as a reverse engineering technologies, now we can doing something about diagonalizing adversarial attacks beyond adversarial detection, beyond saying okay this image is adversarial example or not. We also seeing something different beyond that. I'll give you examples. Suppose you have adversarial input. Suppose you have some adversarial detection or adversarial detector. You know that this is adversarial image, okay? So now let's try to build up a reverse engineer. And we can answer some very interesting questions. For example, what's the clean label corresponding to this adversarial examples? So once this adversarial examples, we know that the prediction is wrong, right? But can we trace back to the original images predictions? So that's a, we can think about clean label. Like this example, so the clean label actually is, is, is the puppy. And second, can we do some attribution problem? For example, can we identify the saliency region of the adversarial attack? So which part this adversarial perturbation is mainly focused on? Uh, so this is, uh, you can think about as, as the adversarial attribution uh, problem. 
And those who can we answer which model used to generate adversarial attacks. So if you are familiar with adversarial attack, um, you will know that adversarial attack needs to be generated based on a certain model. And that model called a weighting model. Because um, like PGD or all the weighting based measures to generate adversarial attacks, you have to point out, hey, uh, we generate this image to fool this model. And now using that adversarial attack to transfer to other models. So attack itself either could be a model based instance. If that's a true, can we reverse engineer about, okay, which model you use to generate the adversarial attack? And also can we understand which attack methods uh, to generate the adversarial examples? Even for the gradient based method, you have PDD, you have FGSM, you have CW attack that is sure we'll uh, mention uh, later as well. So which attack method to generate this adversarial uh, instance? So uh, this, they are all the RED problems, right? Of the right problems. So second examples, uh, let's do step four, um, is about we can using this right technique to tracing back, right? The origins of the transfer attacks. So what is the transfer attacks? Transfer attacks means you generate attack instance from model A, and then you use this attack instance to attack another model B. So now from the uh, uh, defender's perspective, I want to understand where this attack from. Model A or model B? Um, it's a very difficult question, right? Because at the deployment stage, you use this attack to attack model B, but this attack actually generated from model A. So can we trace back the origins of this transfer attacks? So this is a, a one example. You, you have big image and you generate this is a, I do some images with a prediction, with the inquiry prediction piano. You generate this image using some uh, gradient based measure for this model A, from this model A. And now you transfer this adversarial example to attack another model, which is model B. So now the question is okay, um, given this adversarial images, uh, which model used to generate this adversarial image? Actually, it's model A. This is a white box model, not this black box model. So this is a, a one example of the RED as well. Can we trace back? the origins of the transfer attacks um, from the wiki model, from the model perspective. So um, this is another example about using RAT to uh, estimate backdoor triggers. As, as I already mentioned earlier, um, you have some um, data poisoning source, right? You poison the training site and then you learn the model. So when you use this model, actually you only have the information about the model itself, right? You never have the poison training site. So if that's a true, can we do in some very smart way to reverse engineer what about what's a trigger used to generate this as a backdoor model over the point model? So actually we use this as a square trigger, but later on you can use some random input and using some based on this poison poison model and using some red technique, you can reverse engineer, you can reverse engineer um, these triggers even based on uh, this is a random input. Uh, it's not perfect, but um, this gives you some hints about how uh, this is uh, um, poison looks like, and uh, what a trigger yields. So this is called a uh, backdoor trigger estimation program. And we will talk about this uh, later as well. Um, and also, as I mentioned, RED for the manipulation localization. Um, so now we move to the human central attacks where you have the uh, fake images. And the images could be uh, manipulated from some uh, normal images. So now can we use the right technique to understand which pixels, which part of images are manipulated by the guy, by the image editing models. Um, um, this is uh, uh, one of the results. This is a localization mask. You can generate a localization mask. It's also um, 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 the red purple. Okay? And also a red for the model pathway from the thin side images. So this could be very interesting. So in the white box scenarios, you have the gun. You have the generator models, you have the different models. You generate this as a single type of images. But how about in the black box scenarios? You only have the single type of images. Can you trace it back from the single type of images to the generated models? So what generator model you use to generate those single type of images and how uh, it looks like. So there are all the uh, red purples and what we call model passing that is jumping we'll introduce later as well. By the way, model passing also exists in the adversarial examples context. So which model generate adversarial examples, so on and so forth, right? And so now um, I want to conclude the 
introduction part and and trying to um, um, present the goals of the this tutorial and then we can dive into uh, the, uh, the, the the technical approach. So the first goal of this tutorial, we want to introduce the concept of the right, the reverse engineering of deceptions. Um, what's that? And why we consider that? What's the significance? And the second goal is we want to give you overview about how um, this field develops and, and what's the recent achievement from the two aspects. So one aspect is a machine central attacks. You can think about it as a attack plus backdoor attacks. And the second is the human central attacks. You can think about it as a generative models, generative models and so on and so forth. And, and the third thing is to hopefully uh, from this tutorial, we can inspire some new ideas um, 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 in artificial attack and defense technologies, as well as trustworthy AI in general. Um, next, I will pass this tutorial to my colleague, Shirley, and she will talk about uh, reverse, engineer, reverse engineering of artificial perturbations. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I will present on the reverse engineering of adversarial perturbations from the adversarial example. And this is the outline of my part. So the first topic, I will introduce our preliminary work on the developing of a attack tool chain library. And on top of that, I will talk about the, our main problem here to reverse engineering of the adversarial perturbations. So first of all, about the motivation for the attack to chain library. Here, we aim to develop an integrated attack to chain library that goes beyond the existing adversarial attack to boxes. We want to achieve like broader coverage, including both the machine-centric and the human-centric attacks, a more selective list of attack to chains, and also a user interface. And the two attack tool chain library also goes beyond to uh, goes beyond generating the adversarial data sets. We uh, provide the flexibility to serve downstream tasks. In our case, we uh, use it to develop our um, RED approach. And also we, we will also have the continuous improvements to our uh, tool chain library and the data sets on the data quality and the format. Okay, so first of all about the uh, attack tool chain library. So this is our design. We use a parameterized design style to achieve the flexibility and extensibility. So you can specify the attack type, and also with some more details from the adversaries uh, perspective, like uh, is the attack goal as targeted or non-targeted and what's the victim model used and what's the strategy of the attack. Here we show the, uh, this is our uh, project page on GitHub. And here is two examples, the user interface example. So the first one shows to how to generate the non-targeted PJD attack. We just specify the uh, parameters of the attack and the generated data set will be uh, saved into a directory. And the next one is the example of the targeted PJD attack. The difference is that you set the uh, attack goal as T4 targeted. And um, yeah, so for the generated adversary examples from our attack to chain, we will label or uh, name the images with our input parameters such that we can use it for training and testing as the training or testing data in our downstream tasks. Also, besides the label containing the attack information, we also generate a summary of the um, for all the uh, examples in the data set. For example, we uh, numbered the uh, images and uh, have the prediction of the source image and the confidence, uh, et cetera. 
So this uh, summary gives our uh, more statistics about our data set. And here, just some examples of the uh, adversary examples of the deep fake images from our attack to chain library. Okay, so with our uh, attack to chain library and the generated adversarial data sets, the next, uh, the next question we try to explore is how to design a meta classifier that can, um, that can predict the attack tributaries using a supervised learning approach based on our data sets. So for example, we consider uh, different attack attributes like attack type, attack goal, strategy, parameters, and also the victim model types. So along this direction, we, we are trying to answer the following questions. First, how to design the architecture of the meta classifier pipeline? Are we able to resolve the false alarms? and how to deal with data distribution shift, and are we able to generalize to more attributes and to cover both machine-centric and human-centric attacks? So first of all, uh, on the, to answer the first question, we explore the meta-classifier pipeline architecture design. So we start with a simplified problem. We want to design the uh, cl meta-classifier to predict on the attack type. So we generated a small data set with three types of attacks from uh, CNW, FGSM, and the PGD. So here we compare two baseline designs. The first one using only one way of logic inputs. The logic extraction model here is pre-trained model. And we also explore another architecture with two-way logic inputs. Besides the pre-trained logic extraction model, we also use uh, uh, sub-extraction layers from the mm, uh, meta classifier. So those two are co-trained together. So we want to see whether the second architecture can give us better performance. And for the pre-trained logic extraction model, there are two cases. The ideal case is that it is the same model as the victim model, but practically it may be in the black box scenario that the weak model is different. So we explored different, we explored different uh, models for use as the logic extraction model. And here is our um, performance using the baseline one by one way logic input. And here is the performance. And from here, we can observe that when using ResNet 50 as the logic extraction model, we have the best um, performance. And we also did the same experiments to explore different logic extraction models using the uh, uh, baseline architecture two with two-way logic input. And also here that we achieved the highest accuracy when using ResNet 50. But comparing these two, baseline architecture one and the baseline architecture two, the performance is at the similar level. So the conclusion is that we may just uh, use the baseline architecture one with one way logics because the performance is uh, fair enough. Um, okay, so as for the logics extraction model, we further explored the ResNight families to say which one can improve the performance. And from here, we can observe that ResNight uh, 18 has lower performance, but ResNight 50 is good enough. There is no uh, uh, 
so we we, do, we doesn't need to use um more deeper architectures so we uh focus uh we uh converse to the resident 50 as the logic extraction model okay so here is the conclusion on in our uh, solution to the first problem for the meta classifier pipeline design so first of all among the different choices of the logic extraction model rest in the 50 seems to the best choice and also we tried the example model using uh, a, an example of different models but its performance only is similar to vgg still worse than rest night and we believe the performance relates with the model structure but uh, we went further increase the depth doesn't help to improve the performance. So we stay with ResNet 50. And the two-way logic input method doesn't improve over the one-way logic input. So then in the second question, we try to improve the meta classifier to better deal with the false alarms. So uh, as a conclusion from the last problem, we start from the baseline architecture one. And then, uh, we have two improved architectures. We try either to fine tune only the last layer on the logic extraction model, or we fine tune the whole logic extraction model to see whether we can uh, um, achieve better performance in dealing with false alarms. So to conduct the experiments, we now uh, add another label in our data sets that for the clean data. Then we uh, try different vegetable models and the for the logic extraction model, we are using the ResNet 50 and also with improvement. So we can see that by using uh, ResNet 50 as the uh, logic, logic extraction model, and also using the improved architecture too, we can achieve the highest performance in dealing with the case when uh, there could be uh, clean data in our data set. Okay, the next question we are considering is the data distribution shift. So in the previous experiments, we use a fixed parameters when generating those adversarial data sets. And here we consider a range for the, uh, for example, the attack strength epsilon values, and then we um, we can conduct experiments with the improved architecture two and the resident fifty for the logic extraction. So, um, so let's focus on the resident fifty. At, if the vaccine model is the same as the uh, logic extraction model, okay, when there is uh, no data shift in the training and and the testing data set means the hyperparameter is the same, we can achieve very good performance. But if we don't, um, but we can uh, uh, so we if we don't consider the training uh, data distribution shift in the training data set, but we do have the uh, shift in the testing data. In this case, we can observe very uh, large accuracy loss. So the solution should be, we need to incorporate the data distribution shift in the training data set. Then, in the testing case, whether there is a shift or not, we can still achieve reasonable performance. And the same is true when we use other models as the victim model. Okay, so the next question is that we want to generalize our uh, pipeline meta classifier method to both attack tab and victim models. So in so the first step, we consider the different combination of attack tab and uh, 
victim models. So we have a total of 15 class labels and uh, we can observe um, uh, some uh, performance here. And uh, so the overall performance is reasonable. Only the special case is VGG16 as the, the victim model. The performance is uh, lower. Maybe it's due to the um, the architecture difference between VGG16 victim model and the logic extraction model, which we use ResNet50. And the next step we consider to generalize to apply our approach. Our approach was developed based on the machine-centric attack, right? So we apply it to the human-centric attack for uh, deep fake attacks using uh, different models. And the accuracy is, um, is very good, showing the effectiveness of our pipeline. And the last one, we make the whole combination. We have uh, both machine-centric attack and human-centric attack. And also we consider different victim models. And we, uh, for example, this style shows the accuracy when the attack is CNW and the victim model is uh, reception three. So overall the performance seems uh, to be good. Okay, so that's about the attack to chain library part. So based on that, we try to answer the question, uh, is it possible to reverse engineering adversary perturbation from the adversary example? So the figure here shows the famous example of adversary attack. And besides to determine this is attack or not, right? Goes beyond adversary detection. We want to uh, have more information. We want to actually reverse engineering the adversary perturbation from the adversarial attack image. So uh, to perform this experiment, so using our attention loop uh, library, so we develop a training data set considering three types of attack method and the five types of evictive model based on the ImageNet data set. And for the testing data set, we are uh, besides the existing attack type and the victim model combination. We also can uh, consider some unforeseen attack types, including the auto attack and the feature attack to test the generalization of our approach to unforeseen attack. So overall, so we want to answer the underexplored question in the adversarial machine learning that how to reverse engineering the adversarial perturbations from a given adversarial example. But the challenges we face, including the small perturbation, very, the, the perturbations can be very tiny and by using direct denoising may lead to overfitting problem. So in, uh, to solve this problem, we made our contributions by formulating a reverse engineering problem. And also we identify a set of crucial principles in the IED framework design. So actually the IED problem and adversarial detection can be complementary. And in the, uh, at the end of the, the, my part, I will show an example how to use the IED method for the adversarial detection. Okay, so here is some related work on the IED problem. So the most relevant one is ADV MAND, but they have different scenario. And so in our framework, we target at estimating the adversarial perturbations. And also we design some principled evaluation metrics to measure the ID performance. And we compare with the denoise the smoothing DS as our uh, one of the baseline. Here is also the list of some concurrent of our later works on the IED problems. Okay, so first of all, to uh, evaluate 
our approach. We designed some principled evaluation metrics. So the first one is the pixel level reconstruction error, which uh, compares the difference between the um, between the RED estimates with the ground truth. So the X or XRED could be the benign example, benign estimates of the adversary ones. Also, at the prediction level, we uh, measure the prediction alignments. So we want the um, estimated adversarial examples or benign examples should have the same prediction as the ground as the uh, ground truth one, right? So we um, we we will characterize the prediction alignment between the pair of benign examples and its RED and its RED estimate and also PA for the adversarial examples and its RED estimates. Uh, furthermore, we also look at the input attribution alignment between the benign pair and the adversarial pair using the method of grand camp. Okay, so back to the design of uh, RED solution. How to uh, recover the uh, adversarial perturbation from a given adversarial example? A master baseline is by using uh, the direct denoising through an uh, denoising auto encoder. So this is our uh, denoising only baseline. However, it's not surprising that the DO baseline failed because it's difficult to learn the inverse mapping used by the adversary. So for more details about this uh, denoising only method, we, we evaluate using the PA prediction alignment and the input attribu attribution alignment. So here is our comparison of the DO method denoising only with our method in terms of the pixel level reconstruction error and the prediction alignment. So um, we can say that in terms of the pixel level alignment, they, uh, the DO method and our proposed method kind of similar, similar level, but in terms of the prediction alignment, the DO method fails with much lower accuracy. This is due to the, uh, the lacking of denoising ability. Okay, so um, then we also look at the uh, input attribution alignment, right? We want to know uh, what does the uh, neural network see for making decisions? So we apply the grand cam method. So a quick uh, introduction about the grand cam. It uh, localized the input patterns used for a certain prediction. So this is uh, an image and this is the grand cam generated. It localizing the, some key uh, input patterns that is crucial for the prediction. And also here is uh, another example. So the grand cam showing some um, key information in the input attribution. So then we compare the denoising only method with our, uh, with, with the ground truth. We plot the grand cam and as a comparison, so the column, this column and this column is the uh, grand cam with respect to the correct label. And this column and this column is the grand cam with respect to the target adversarial label. In both cases, we can say um, the grand cam from DO method is very different 
from that of the uh, ground truth, explaining the difference, I mean, the, the failure of the old method in, uh, in estimates the adversarial perturbation. So um, our solution to this problem is uh, we, you, we design a class discriminative denoiser with data augmentation. So the first uh, method, we apply predict a prediction alignment to enhance the class discriminative ability for the constructed or estimated benign example and adversarial example. Also, we apply data augmentation to boosting the denoising capability by providing multiple views of the same data through transformations such as rotation, flipping, and translation. So this is the overview of our framework. And we, it includes uh, the denoiser, denoiser network and also they, uh, the, the denoiser network is to estimate the adversarial perturbation. And also we have a pre-trained classifier to deliver logic. So those two are related through the regularization on the prediction alignment. Also, we um, apply data augmentation to, um, to transform the input to boost the denoising performance. Okay, so first of all, how to uh, enhance the prediction alignment. So we, uh, we put a regularization on the prediction alignment. So this is the prediction alignment for the benign prediction. This is from ID estimation. This is the original one. And this one is the for, to enforce the prediction alignment with the, on the adversarial pre prediction. So then the PA regularization is used together with the denoising loss. And uh, furthermore, for the data augmentation, the rational behind is that we want to incorporating the data transformation, which can make the RED forwarded to the most informative attack artifacts. And also we, um, we can uh, perhaps with the identification of the transformation resilient benign or adversarial instances to uh, enhance the capability for the prediction alignment and the input attribution alignment. So first of all, we explored what type of data augmentation could help with our design, right? So first of all, we mainly focus on the spatial transformations, and then we evaluate them both on the pixel level and the prediction level. So from our um, uh, testing, we found that the cut, mix, and chopping and the padding can help with the PA alignment and also has a lower uh, pixel level uh, reconstruction error. Uh, so we combine, we use both of them in our, as our data augmentation. So now he, here comes our overall, the training uh, objective. So which is actually uh, includes the denoising loss, incorporating data augmentation, and the PA regularization part, also incorporated with data augmentation. For the data augmentation, we also narrow down to a subset. We, we make the selection by making sure that after the transformation, we don't change the prediction. So this is the constraint on the transformation subset. So here is our uh, comparison in terms of the reconstruction error and the prediction alignment. So our uh, CDD RED framework achieves similar class discriminative ability as the, the, the uh, denoising smoothing 
method, but we have better pixel level denoising performance. Also, we our method is robust to the attack with different uh, hyperparameter settings. And furthermore, in terms of the input attribute attribution alignment, our framework has a, a similar input attribution with the ground truth. So we can say the, the localized regions are very similar with the ground truth, but the DO and the DS method is, not, is quite different from the ground truth. And furthermore, we um, look at the uh, attribution alignment. Our uh, method has a denser concentration over the high value area in the distribution of the attribution LU score. So furthermore, when we prepare in the data set, right, we have a subset for unseen, unforeseen attacks. So the first part, we uh, engineered the unforeseen attack type by using partially perturbed data through linear interpolation. And this is the perturbation, the x-axis showing the portion of the perturbation. So uh, in summary, our approach is the closest to the ground truth in terms of the prediction accuracy and attack success rate. And the, the denoise smoothing method has, uh, has overestimation for the additive uh, perturbation. So furthermore, we test with the unseen testing data. And again, we have achieved very high prediction alignment in this case. Furthermore, we consider extension of our uh, framework to different problem. So we're using our, our framework to infer the correlation between adversaries. So the, this uh, correlation matrix, the figure A is from the ground truth and the figure B showing the correlation from our RED uh, estimation and the ground truth. So we can say it, uh, our estimation in the cor correlation coincides with the ground truth very well. And furthermore, so for the case that there is a new attack, right? Can we, inf uh, can we infer the attack identity using our uh, RED approach? So we, uh, we develop the correlation screening. So in this example, we suppose we have a new attack, which is a PJD attack on a victim model AlexNet, which this um, combination doesn't exist in our training data set. Then we compute this correlation and we find the VGG19 and the PJD attack has the highest correlation uh, value. So meaning that those two are the most, this new attack, AlexNet PJD is the most uh, similar to this one. Maybe this is because the architectural similarity between the two victim model architectures. And also we think they, uh, our IED problem can help with adversarial detection. The original is that we believe the adversary example will cause a high attribution dissimilarity between the pre-RED and the post-RED input. So, um, we develop an, our ID based detector, then we observe a superior detection performance for the detection of adversarial examples. And furthermore, we also apply it for the provable uh, defense. So we train the ID models to construct smooth classifier and comparing with other baseline, we achieve better certified accuracy. 
So here is the conclusion for our um, framework. So first of all, the DO denoising only method fails for our problem. This is due to the misaligned normal and adversarial predictions and uh, um, so minimizing only on the reconstruction error is not enough. Also, we, be, we found that the input attribution alignment is a desirable IED metric to identify where the adversary attempts to perturb. And as a summary, by our uh, class discriminative denoiser framework, we can achieve good performance in the mean absolute error prediction alignment input uh, attribution explanation uh, simultaneously. And this is our uh, project page on GitHub. So that's my uh, part. So maybe we can take a break. Yeah, and we are here um, on the same question the same time as the first and the same time as well. And otherwise, let's have a 10 minute break. And after the break, uh, we'll talk about something else. You know, this is a um, what we can see. I mean, I guess on the flip side, then, is like your technique to detect this type of attack is that generalized, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. or just be like a product that every mm -hmm. similarity mm -hmm. of the Yeah. 
Results we guys share are already gone. Like noise coordination is, uh, but it could generalize. It, it, it could so it is physically realized. We got that slide where it has stop sign and it's right exactly. So uh, when looking at that, how much do you know the results going to translate into those kinds of values? So far, so far we
我们想做的事情，我们做的事情，我们做的事情，我们做的事情，我们做的事情，我们做的事情，我们做的事情，我们做的事情，我们做的事情，我们做的事情，我们做的事情，我们做的事情，我们做的事情，我们做的事情，我
So what does it mean? This means uh, in the first part, as uh, she mentioned, we are trying to uh, estimate adversarial perturbations from adversarial examples. But what, what else we can do uh, through the uh, lens of the RED? And here I will introduce one um, um, a new viewpoint, which is called model passing. So basically we are trying to understand what deep neural network um, are used to generate adversarial examples. Um, because you will see that adversarial example generation is actually is a model dependent uh, most of the time. Okay. Um, and this is our old friend. Uh, we have uh, seen this as a picture uh, in many ways uh, in today's talk. Um, the perturbations uh, is clear. Um, we know how to estimate that. At least we made some efforts uh, about how to estimate these perturbations. And um, as I said, clearly we focus on the RD question how to estimate adversarial perturbations. So now let's look at a new question. We want to ask how to infer the hidden thread model information uh, from the attack of perturbation instances. Okay, how to define this is a hidden thread model information. I will show one example in the following slides. So again, the goal, the scope is trying to understand what thread model information that we can guess, we can infer from the attack instances, which means at result examples or perturbations without using any model. Okay. Um, uh, recall the result attack generation process. Let's just give the simplest method, um, which is called FGSN, fast gradient set method. Again, so this is a master name, this is a tag master name, um, because um, 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 this is um, actually, the, um, uh, this is generated from some uh, alternation measure, and there's a the gradient sum based alternation measure. So the generation process is very simple. Uh, you generate a perturbation delta, what's a delta? Delta is, this is a perturbation, this is a small perturbation in this red, uh, red block, uh, in the red box. So this is a perturbation is uh, um, uh, generated from two things. The first thing is epsilon. Ipso means you're trying to uh, generate a perturbation following some um, perturbation radius. That means every pixels can at most uh, perturb uh, with value Ipso. So this is a perturbation uh, strength. And second thing is uh, uh, the direction. So which direction you're trying to perturb your pixel? You're trying to perturb your images. This is given by the sun based direction. The sun operation is just uh, uh, return either positive one or negative one. If, if this number is positive, then return one. If this is negative, it returns negative one. And within this sum operation, okay, there's a, this is a gradient. This is a key message. Uh, the gradient uh, is uh, built upon the original image X, as well as the neural network you used to generate artificial perturbation delta. So therefore, from the RD perspective, we want to, we want to ask the following questions. Given delta, can we guess the properties of the theta? Theta is the neural network you use to generate the perturbations, delta. And given delta, or given this is a perturbative examples, can we infer some properties about the theta? So this is a, um, already a, 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 a problem. Okay, uh, how this perturbation generated, you can understand from the following, uh, um, uh, um, this is a figures as well. You have input x. This, this actually is the clean input, the binary input. There's no perturbations on top of that. So now I want to generate some perturbations on top of that to full machine learning models decision. So how can we do that? We're using BP. We use the bifurcations. But given a model, so given, uh, given the theta, this is a model called a VT model. The model you use to generate attack instances, this is a model called a VT model. And given these models, you do the BP. You're trying to maximize the prediction error. So um, therefore, um, uh, you, you have generated the uh, gradients. Okay, uh, it's a maximization problem, but same thing as a minimization problem. You just consider the opposite way. So therefore, you need to use the BP to generate the gradient directions um, with respect to the input X, because you want to generate the perturbations with respect to X. Okay. So, um, and this is a BP, um, finally, we'll give you this gradient information. The, uh, the uh, nebula X, uh, LL is a uh, uh, loss function. So, um, so as you can see from these examples, a tag is generated based on some machine learning models, theta. So this is, a, as I said, it's a weak team models. Can we infer uh, this weak team model information from attack instances? 
So this is the goal of the reverse engineering. You give me the adversarial images, give me the perturbations. Can, can I tell you something saying, okay, um, rather than 18 is yield to generate these perturbations. So this is a goal. Um, this is another uh, figures that can help you to understand this is a problem. And what we call this problem is the model passing because I want to uh, pass the model details from the attack incident, uh, instances, or I don't have examples or perturbations. So to reverse engineer the information of victim model used by the adversary. So um, the left figure, as you can see, this is adversary image generation process. The left column is the original image. And then given some victim model, this victim model can contain several properties, right? For example, um, architecture type. VGG, res Z, res 18, res 50, so on and so forth. So, and also kernel size, right? Kernel size is another um, 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 uh, properties, main properties actually uh, matters for the CNN as well. And also active function. Active function also very important because uh, active function directly relates to the type of active function directly relates to model robustness. Uh, if you are familiar with uh, uh, I don't saw robustness. And also with sparsity, it's a sparse model or it's a dense model. So basically, there's a many configuration you can consider to build up this, this new network, and then use new, this new network to generate adversarial examples. So now the question is for the model passing is given the adversarial attacks only, given the adversarial examples only, can we build up some parser? Can we build up some model passing network, another neural neural network? trying to help us to answer the following questions, trying to help us to infer the victim model attributes used by uh, the generated, uh, uh, used to generate adversarial attacks. For example, what's architecture type you used to generate those adversarial examples? What's activity function you used? What's the kernel set this victim model used? And what's the specification? So why we focus on those mode properties? Because um, um, they are all, either indirectly or directly relate to the adversarial buses. Um, so um, therefore in the following slides, in the following uh, presentation, I will focus on these four model properties. Again, um, um, the, the pipeline of the model passing is, you, you have the adversarial examples. You know that this adversarial, this adversarial text or examples were generated by another model. But what you have is you only have these attack instances. You want to generate some reverse engineering network to infer the model properties which used to generate the adversarial attack instances. So this is a, uh, this is a problem of the model pattern. Um, um, as, I, as, I, as, I, as I highlighted here, uh, this is a key part. And this is uh, uh, the, the problem statement, okay? And uh, let me give you um, another example from the transfer attack perspective, because we mentioned the transfer attack uh, in the introduction part. So suppose we can uh, infer model properties of the attack um, that generated from these models. Now we can help uh, the RED, the red can help us to trace back the regions of the attack instances, right? So these examples, we generate attack instances from mod using model A. The model is the true source victim model. And now we have this perturbed image. It's here, it's adversary. And now we use this adversary um, to attack another model. So actually this is a fresh model, but we, we, we didn't use model B to generate attack, but we use attack to attack this model B. So now if the defender at the uh, model B found, okay, this is adversary attack. Now we want to ask one more question. Who generated this ad adversary attack? I read the model A, right? So this is uh, um, this is uh, 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 another key application I will show uh, later. If we can have this RED uh, network or RED models, we can actually trace back to the origin, uh, to the origin of the adversarial examples. So which model actually generate this transfer attack? So this is a key question. Actually, this is a key benefit uh, that we can use the RED to achieve in the transfer attack scenario. Okay, uh, model passing can reveal the origins of the transfer attack. This is a key message uh, I want to emphasize here. So um, the first question uh, to, uh, uh, is uh, to investigate the passing ability from the adversarial attack is, we want to understand the feasibility question first, right? Is that possible? 
um, 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 if that's possible, how good it is, right? So therefore you have to build up some, um, some data set, uh, some scenarios that you are able to pass model parameters from the uh, uh, adversarial attacks. So um, the first thing uh, I want to emphasize here is we consider, um, actually the, this is a project considers a bunch of the adversarial attacks with the different types. So this is a, a, a text we, uh, we for interest in, okay? Um, here are some notations that we introduce. Uh, GD refers to gradient descent. This is basically means attack measure. Okay? And WB means white box model. So white box means attacker knows everything about this VT model. You can do the BP, right? Because you want to generate adult perturbation, you have to use BP. Then you have to know the model, how the model looks like. And the BB means black box model. This means you cannot do BP because attackers only has query access to these models. You can only query them all to generate the attack instance, but you cannot do the propagation. So this is a two families of the adversarial attacks. Um, people call white box attack and the black box attack. So um, in the model pathing program, we will consider both types of these adversarial attacks. So the first one is white box which means attack perturbations is generated based on the input gradient um, given the model is white box to the adversary. Um, so we have the four types of the white box, uh, white box adversarial attacks, FGSM, as I mentioned early, and the PDD. PDD, you can think about as the iterative versions of the FGSM. It's called, the P means projected. Um, you, you want to project the perturbation onto some LP ball constraint. And GD is a gradient descent. And CW, CW is a, another attack name, but um, it's also iterative attack generation method, but just use the different attack logs. And auto attack, auto attack is the attack family. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a like, um, um, it's an ensemble attack, I think about. It contains several different attacks. And it's the ensemble of the uh, gradient based attacks um, and including uh, something else. But here we call auto attack. But those four uh, attack types, um, are all belonging to the battle box attack. So why I want to emphasize this, because um, those attacks are built on top of the input gradient. And the input gradient has a model information as we show here, right? So the input gradient has in the function of the theta, has a, has a dependence on the VT model. So therefore you can imagine um, reverse, engineering, reverse engineering of these white box attacks should be easier compared to the next family I will introduce, which is the black box attacks. Because those white box attacks are relying on the input gradient, which, uh, which are the, the, function, uh, the functions of the VT models. And the second family, I will focus on the black box attacks. Um, 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 how to generate the black box attacks? Um, the basic, basic thing, uh, it uses model queries. Um, you, you perturb the input and you look at the output of the models. And then based on the output of models, you make a decision about how to perturb the pixels in the next round. So you don't have to use the gradients, but you need to query the model many times. Okay. Um, and here we consider three types of the black box attacks, uh, square attacks. Square attack is typically the, uh, built up on the uh, random search. And uh, NES, NES is uh, uh, using the um, kind of genetic algorithms, but actually they also um, uh, build up on the model queries and the estimated input gradients. It's a gradient um, um, estimation type attacks. And also zero solder size GD, this is another uh, using model queries to estimate input gradient. Again, you cannot compute input gradient using BP, but you can use model queries to estimate input gradient. So therefore, in this is a three black box attacks. The first one square attack, the build up, you build up on the random search, okay? The last two attacks are built up on the input gradient estimation using the model function queries, okay? So why we want to uh, show this is the landscape of the attack attacks because we want to understand the model passing abilities across the full spectrum of the different attacks. So what I can tell you here is, if we consider white box attack, then model passing is possible. And actually, it's pretty uh, straightforward. And you will see very surprising uh, the model passing performance. You are able to infer model properties from the attack instances, especially for white box attack. 
However, for the black box attack, especially for the square attack, it's very difficult to infer model properties from the attack instance. Why? Because random search does not directly rely on the model information, right? You just uh, random generate perturbations on the pixels. But you will see uh, the, the, conclu the conclusions later. So besides attack types, um, we also need to build up on a library about the model configurations. Because um, given the one model instance, you generate other attacks based on this model. And the goal is from the attack outcomes, you want to infer, okay, um, what are properties this model you use. Therefore, you have to have a library about the model configurations. So um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, so we consider four possible configuration um, uh, uh, scenarios. So the first one is the uh, architectural type. So either we use ResZ9 or ResZ18 or ResZ20, those ResZ family models, or we use the VGG family models. We only consider CN models. There's no transformer, there's no VIT here. Um, but this would be a, a very good direction to consider VIT. But here we only consider the CN models. And then we also vary the activation function types given the CN models. For example, so we use the relu function, it's commonly used, it's a non smooth at zero. And we also consider other two types of uh, two types of the smooth activation functions, tangent h and elu functions. They are smooth. So why? Because the smoothness of the activation function actually is the key factors to affect uh, the model robustness. Uh, if you are, uh, if you know uh, this is uh, uh, a training or I don't robustness stuff. But here we consider activation types, which means given the VGG model, we change different activation functions, different activation function types. Then you give, it give us, it results in different model instances. And also we change the kernel size, um, the three by three, five by five, seven by seven, and we change the model sparsity, the weight sparsity. Okay, so that's model is 25% uh, of the weight prune model, or so on and so forth. We consider weight sparsity. So as you can see, every combination across these four uh, uh, configuration items will give you one specific weight model. It's a resident nine and with a relu h as a, with a relu as an activation function and a, a using kernel size three by three and a, uh, with a weight sparsity 70, uh, 75%, right? So therefore a combination of those properties give you one specific model instance. So once you have this, uh, you can think about, we generate many attacks, many attack examples based on this many model configurations. And then we investigate, okay, whether or not we can infer the model configuration properties or classes you can think about from the generated attack instances. And we also consider our different evaluation uh, measures uh, as I will show later. But this is the whole uh, picture. You have the many attacks generated from this many model configurations. You want to understand what configurations um, that we can infer from the attack samples, okay? Uh, so how can we uh, uh, formulate this is the model pathing problems? And so far, uh, we only try a, a simple method, supervised learning, because we have those uh, attack data set. We have this model data set. We want to understand whether or not we can train a supervised class file um, uh, based on this attack data to infer the model attributes. And uh, uh, surprisingly, um, uh, the learned uh, supervised class file um, uh, behaves uh, um, um, very good um, in some scenarios. Um, I will show later. So this is uh, motivates us to uh, consider more evolved uh, methods to build up this model pathing network. But so far, we consider supervised learning. So we approach the model pathing problems as a standard supervised learning uh, task applied to the adversarial uh, examples or tags. So the data set, as I mentioned earlier, you have the data set of the adversarial examples across seven attack types. You have four white box attacks, three black box attacks, and generated from 135 weighty models um, uh, configured by the five properties um, that I showed earlier, okay? Um, these are five architecture, architecture types, uh, three kernel set setups, uh, three activation function types, and, and the three uh, with, with sparse ratios. And the model passing network, we first try is we, we, we were thinking about whether or not we can try a simple network, like uh, the, the simple cone net or the MLP network. Uh, but here we consider, uh, I just here just show a simple uh, cone net. So this is a pipeline for the model passing network. 
you take the input, uh, you take the input from the adversarial attacks, either perturbations or adversarial examples. Uh, later on, I will discuss which input format give you the best performance for the RED. Um, generally speaking, uh, using adversarial perturbation as the input will give you the better performance. But again, how to obtain the perturbations? That could be a challenging task for the input format itself. And we can use some uh, perturbation estimation measure as I sure introduced already. Okay? But given this attack instances, either perturbation format or adversarial example format, you fit them into this is a, a supervised class file. And this is a, a supervised class file contains two parts. One part is a representation network, another part is a multi height uh, for the classification tasks. And each head uh, is trying to identify which architecture type and which uh, kernel size and which IT function and which width sparsity. So now you're just using this data set to learn that and evaluate the performance. But however, that's still not, not, not enough because you have to address several training and evaluation challenges that I will introduce later, okay? And the first challenge for the training is, as I mentioned, the, the one question is what a data format we should consider as the input of the model passing network, either at result example or perturbation. So from the defender, from the reverse engineer perspective, definitely we want at result example, right? Because um, it's very difficult to directly obtain the adversarial perturbations. So um, however, um, from the performance perspective, using adversarial perturbation as the input of the model passing is better. The reason that you can think about from the FGSM examples, because the perturbations is a direct function, is a direct function of the victim model theta. Uh, as we show here, delta is the function of the theta. You can still generate as examples. You just need to plus x, but this perturbation typically is very small. If you add the perturbation to the original image, then the many perturbation inf information will be overridden by the original example pixels, right? So that's why using perturbation is better from the perspective on the RED performance. But in, in practice, uh, it's not feasible, right? It's very difficult to, to get the perturbations directly from the adversarial examples. So therefore you need to inject the additional module. The module is trying to estimate uh, the perturbations from the adversarial examples if your input is the adversarial example. So this is how to build up, this is uh, called um, um, perturbation estimation network pin. Uh, you can use the measure uh, from the uh, uh, shear part as well. So actually we, we did that. So eventually it become a supervised learning problem. So you want to train this model passing network based on this uh, supervised data set, right? We, we collect this training set. And then uh, together with additional loss, you're trying to train this uh, perturbation estimation network. So then once you train that, and you deploy these models, and you can take the adversarial examples as an input to do this model passing job. So now this comes to another question, how to evaluate? Um, evaluation itself is not trivial. The reason is you have to consider two scenarios. One scenario is in-distribution um, evaluation. What does the in-distribution mean here? So we are trying to reverse engineer attack instances for the model attributes. So therefore one in-distribution generation that we should consider is we fix the attack method, but just using different images. Like we, we just consider different test images, right? To generate adversarial examples, but the attack method could be still be same as the training site. So this is called in-attack distribution generation. We only change the images. In the training site, you have the same attack method to perturb the training site. And the testing phase, you use the same attack measure, but to perturb different images, which is in the test set. And then we want to understand in this, in these scenarios, is that possible to do the model passing, to estimate, to precisely estimate model properties from the attack instances over the new images. And the more, a more challenging scenario is out of attack distribution generation. Out of attack, attack distribution means at a testing time, you even generate some new attack measure. A new, you will consider some new attack measures. Like some attack measures we never cover in the training set. And this is called out of attack distribution generation. What here um, uh, to align with uh, uh, classification problem, we, we call the auto distribution generation, but it's still actually for attack, okay? not for the image. 
So we want to consider new attack measures uh, applied to the new test images. Okay, so this is called auto distributed generation. So I will show uh, in in some scenarios, um, uh, the model pathing actually is also possible for the auto for the auto attack distribution scenarios. So um, this gives you the whole pipeline. I want to, um, um, before I present some um, uh, interesting um, uh, experiment results, I want to give you some uh, um, keynote about the whole pipeline. The training is, we, we use this as uh, aerosol perturbations. Uh, we use these aerosol examples as the input, as the input of the model pathing network. And we have the super data set. And then we use this as a standard um, um, fabrication method to train the model pathing network, MPN. This is a training. And the testing is we deploy this train network. And now we consider two different testing scenarios. One is a in a distribution testing, which means we use consider the same attack method at the training set, but apply to different test images. The image become different, but the attack method still stay. So therefore we want to say, okay, in that scenarios, whether or not we can do, we can choose the model pathing performance, which means we can correctly estimate the model properties from the attack instances uh, built upon the new test images. A second um, uh, evaluation setting is auto distribution, auto attack distribution. At a testing time, once this model passing network is deployed, we even consider some new attack method applied to the new test images. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, two uh, testing scenarios. So um, the next, uh, let's see some uh, interesting uh, experiment results. So um, here I focus on the favor 10 data set. Um, and and, and uh, later on, um, uh, we also try some other data set, but favor 10 data set itself, um, you know, uh, we also give you some very convincing results as well. So uh, once again, um, the attack types, we consider the, this is a, a seven uh, attack methods on the four white box attacks three black box attacks, okay? And for the model attributes that we want to infer, uh, we can turn so this are four categories. Model architecture type, AT and uh, uh, kernel size, RS, activation function, AF, as well as uh, weight sparsity. And for each, uh, uh, each uh, model attribute, you have many values, okay? We want to uh, correctly infer the specific model attribute used by the other attacks. This is a model passing. So this is the figures shows the in distribution generations. Um, once again, um, we report an average model passing accuracy and under different attack measures and the same return are using aerosol perturbations as the input. Here's the ideal case. We use the perturbation as a model passing network to estimate the model attributes. So how do we read these tables? Um, here, um, each row, and AT accuracy is the basically means the accuracy of the inferring the values of the architecture types. And the second row AF means inferring the specific activation types accuracy and so on and so forth. TS is kernel size and WS means width sparsity. Okay. And here each um, block in the column wise, uh, this basically shows attack types. So that those examples are generated using FGSM or uh, PGD or something else, or CW. So here we consider white box attacks. All, they are all gradient-based attacks. And we also consider different hyperparameters when generated those attacks. The epsilon means attack perturbation strength. This is one of the hyperparameters you can specify during the attack generation at the testing time. Okay. We consider different epsilons. And also a different uh, uh, LP norm for the PD attack. Okay, so now let's look at this is uh, uh, performance. As you can see, very surprisingly, um, we you can achieve the more than um, ninety percent of the model pathing accuracy from the attack instances only using the learned model attribute uh, model pathing network. So this is applied to every um, categories of this is the model attributes. So now let's move to a, a more practical case, which means we still consider the same evaluation, but we use the adversarial examples as the input of the model passing network, which means given the adversarial example as the input, you have to estimate perturbations from the adversarial examples and then uh, feed them into the model passing network to estimate model attributes hidden behind this adversarial attack instances. 
So um, um, here, as as you uh, as we introduced uh, early, um, uh, we use uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, estimated perturbation estimation network to estimate these atom cell perturbations. And, and and you can see that um, if you if you make a very a detailed comparison, you will see that the second tables, uh, the performance in the second tables is lower than the first table. But still, uh, the model passing accuracy um, maintains in, in a very in, in, in a very high accuracy regime. In the architectural type accuracy, you can see that it's still over uh, ninety percent, uh, so on so forth. And also another thing you can observe that if you consider if you're trying to increase the perturbation strength epsilon, so generally speaking, with a larger perturbation strength, then the model passing become easier, uh, relatively speaking. Okay, you can see that the model passing accuracy increases as the epsilon, as the epsilon increases. So it's not surprising because uh, if you recall, this is uh, FGSM examples. All the model information content in the gradient part, right? If you increase epsilon, basically you're trying to amplify this gradient information. So um, that's why if you consider um, the larger epsilon, then the model passing accuracy becomes slightly better. Um, there's a two uh, takeaway messages here. The first one is the model passing is possible for gradient-based atoms attacks. Here, I only show the gradient-based attacks. Okay, I, I, I haven't shown the black box attacks. And second, uh, the model passing using this uh, true atoms of perturbations um, definitely is, uh, is better compared to estimated perturbations. But even for the estimated perturbations, the model passing accuracy is still pretty good. So this is one of the surprising uh, uh, findings for us uh, trying to using this model passing network to reverse engineer model attributes from the attack instances directly. And here, this will give you the full pictures about this is a uh, uh, generation performance, including the out of distribution generation. So there's a matrix here. Uh, let me get you about how to read this matrix. So this is a uh, uh, each row represents a training attack setup, training attack types, which means you use what uh, the, the what attack method you use to generate attack uh, instances in the training set. Okay, for example. You can see the PDL infinity as a default attack measure to generate a for example in the training set. And then you use that to train the model passing network. And each column is testing time attack types, which means you use, you consider what attack measure to perturb test time images and to evaluate the performance of the learned model passing network using attacks in the training set. Okay. So therefore the diagonal line shows in distribution performance. You use the same attack measure at the training and testing, but different images for sure. Okay. And all the diagonal shows um, um, this auto distribution generation performance. You train on one attack type, but a test on another attack type. And this attack type is different from the training set. So this is off diagonal entries. So there's the, um, several interesting uh, findings. The first one is if you look at all the diagonal entries, so all the generalization problems of the model passing networks, they have some community fashion, right? It's a block diagonal. Um, you see that uh, this is a, there's a block here, right? And then second block here and so on and so forth. There's some um, community structure content uh, in this is a, um, a full matrix. And this, if you take a close look at the community, you will find that um, they are all belong to similar attack types. For example, the first community, PDL infinity, or FGSF, auto attack L infinity attack, auto PDL infinity attack. They are all belong to L infinity attacks, right? And the second one is CW PDL2 and, and the auto attack L2, and they are all belong to L2 attacks by default. So, uh, so therefore there's some, um, if you take a look at all the diagonal entries, if the tag measure fall into the same family, then auto distribution generations um, uh, looks, uh, looks okay. But if the tag family are quite different, if you take a look at the off diagonal entries, um, and this is uh, up corner, you will see that the model passing accuracy becomes pretty low. That means auto distribution generation for model passing still very challenging. 
And also we consider the last row. What's the last row? Last row means we plan all the trading side, all the attack method to, 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 to generate the trading side. And then to train this as a model passing network and then evaluate uh, all the um, attack method at the testing time. You will see that the performance become pretty good because it become in distribution case. There's no auto distribution consideration unless two scenarios, the last two columns. So what's the last two columns? The last two columns are corresponding to a square attack. So what's a square attack? Square attack is based on random search. So therefore, if attack itself does not contain model information, then there's no surprising model passing becomes uh, invisible. So um, this is still delivers the pretty key message. Uh, model passing seems uh, feasible for the gradient based adversarial attacks, but for the uh, the query based random search based attacks like square attacks, the model passing becomes very difficult. You cannot precisely infer uh, the attribution, the model attribute accuracy. Here, this is a heat map, and each numbers um, uh, means the model passing accuracy over the model attributes that I showed earlier. Okay. So this is a, a key message. Uh, square attacks are hard to pass for the model attributes. And uh, we can also uh, uh, show uh, the transfer attack as examples. Um, uh, recall that uh, one critical question we want to answer is whether or not we can uncover, we can infer true model attributes for the transfer attacks, like these scenarios. You generate attack uh, examples from model A, but you use these attack examples for the model B. And given the attack examples, can we infer, can we precisely identify the attributes from the model A, the actual, uh, model architecture type, function type, uh, activation function type, kernel size, and the model weight sparsity, so on and so forth. So this is a, a, a this is a matrix first shows the transfer attack performance. Okay, so transfer attack performance means uh, you generate an attack uh, from the model A, and then you test this attack on another model, model B, and you look at the attack success rate on the model B. Okay. So this gives you transfer attack success rate. It's not a, this is not a, this is not a model passing accuracy. This is a transfer attack success rate. And how to read this? This is a matrix. And if you look at the each row, actually give you the combinations of the model attributes. Uh, for example, the first row shows relu active functions with kernel size three and uh, uh, dense model zero zero percent of the weight sparsity. So this combination give you a specific model. You use these models to generate adversarial examples. That's what each row tells you. These are true source models used to generate adversarial attacks. What's a column means? So each column means the target model. You transfer this attack to another model and it can be different model. So therefore diagonal means no transfer happens, right? You just generate attack model A and test on model A. And off diagonal entries means transfer scenarios. You generate a model A and transfer to other models. And each of uh, the heat map uh, here, each cell point means a tax as a rate. The brighter, the better, the brighter of uh, the 100% attack as a rate, which means all the perturbation on the test data set can successfully fool the model's decision for the model B, for the target model. So there's uh, two interesting findings. First of all, uh, we can find that the first regions is hard to transfer. So this is for transfer attack scenario. We haven't uh, talked about model passing, but you see that transfer attack performance has a relationship with the model passing performance. So the first community you can say is hard to transfer because only diagonal, only diagonal lines give you the high attack success rate. That means no transfer happens. But off diagonal, off diagonal entries shows you a little bit uh, slower, a little bit lower or smaller attack success rate in the transfer scenarios. So these are hard transfer scenarios. In fact, this is very interesting because this is scenario actually corresponding to a relu type neural network. So why? Because in the activation function, we consider three types, right? Relu, elu, and tenure H. Relu is only activation function, which is not smooth. And elu and, uh, uh, and uh, tenure H, they are smooth activation functions. So therefore, it's very difficult. Relatively speaking, it's difficult 
to try to attack from the relu based models to other nice smooth activation uh, to, 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 to another smooth activation based models. That's why this force regime is hard to transfer because the force regime corresponds to relu based models. And we can also see the second regime is easy to transfer. And this is because off diagonal entry become higher. The test rate on the off diagonal entry become higher. And they are actually corresponding to uh, the ELU and uh, uh, tangent H based uh, models uh, because they are all belong to smooth activation functions. So now let's look at the model passing. Suppose this is a transfer type performance. Let's look at model passing. Very surprisingly, for the model passing, we have, you have very similar scenarios. And each row represents the true source model. You generate this is a transfer type. And each column um, um, uh, here means prediction, means the model passing network trying to predict the model attributes from this transfer attacks. So um, therefore the diagonal line means the credit prediction. So you generate an attack from model A for the, from row A from the first row. And now if the model passing gives you the correct model attribute prediction, then this is the first diagonal entry should be higher. Because this is a confusing matrix, the other prediction are wrong. The only if the attack from the model A, the first row, then only this entry should be high by expectation. But indeed, this is a model passing performance. And all of the entry is actually corresponding to the incorrect predictions of the model attributes. So one, one surprising thing is, regardless of this is a transfer of text and said rate differences, but from the model passing perspectives, we can still keep very high correct model passing accuracies along the diagonal line, which means model passing is easier. Seems that um, in addition to the transfer attack performance, regardless of the hard to transfer or easy, or easy to transfer, you can always predict the correct uh, the model attributes uh, from the transfer attacks. So this is a good sign for us because Regardless of the transfer attack types, you can always identify the correct model attributes hidden in the transfer attacks. So uh, once again, the red matrix that is a model passing confusing matrix. The diagonal line is the, is the model passing accuracy and the off diagonal means error, means incorrect prediction errors. So the diagonal line higher the better, the off diagonal line is lower the better. So that's why this is uh, give us a very um, uh, uh, surprising uh, the model passing performance in the transfer attacks, regardless of the, any transfer attacks, you are able to pass the model attributes from the transfer attacks. Okay. And here, uh, there's a several summary. I want to, um, uh, uh, I want to conclude my, uh, my part. The first one, is it is possible to infer model attributes from gradient based adversarial attacks. Second, in distribution generations, um, there's no attack shift there's no attack shape data testing. Um, in that, if that's the case, that model passing become easy. It become much easier. You can you can see the model passing accuracy over ninety percent uh, most of the time. And the third uh, uh, statement is for the auto distribution generation. If there's a attack shift uh, at the testing time, that model passing become difficult. You will see the community block. If the attack from the same family, that is possible to pass. Otherwise, it will still be very difficult to pass model attributes from the attacks. And that's why, uh, surprisingly, we are able to uh, identify the true source model attributes from the transfer attacks, regardless of the easy to transfer or hard to transfer. So this is the one uh, important applications using the RED to diagnose the origins of the transfer attacks. And here, if you are interested in this topic, um, here's the project page. And we list uh, several references, uh, including our own works, together with the codes, and you can play with them. And next, I will um, I'll pass this to my colleague Xiaoming, and he will talk about RED for, oh, sorry, it's still my turn. <laughs> Backdoor attacks. Okay, no, no, no use. Okay, um, okay, um, um, besides the result attacks, uh, next, I will talk about the backdoor attacks. Okay. Um, uh, what's the backdoor attacks? As I mentioned in the introduction part, so now we move to the training phase. Okay, we are trying to inject uh, some uh, potential in the training phase. And that Tyson phase, if some same patterns, same trojan or backdoor, backdoor pattern is present at test time, 
then the model, the learner model, which is called a poison model, Trojan model, will make an incorrect prediction. So this is different from the Arizona examples because we are trying to manipulate training data points, okay? So this is the examples um, uh, that uh, I have shown early. Um, this trigger is a, a poison pattern that we want to manipulate the training data. You just adding these triggers on top of the training data and then train the model. And once the model is learned, if the trigger is present at the testing time, then the model will make the incorrect prediction. Okay. So from the RED lens, uh, what questions do we want to ask? Uh, the first question is how to infer trigger uh, pattern. The trigger estimation, if given the poison model, can we estimate the triggers from the backdoor model? So this is one of the key questions uh, for the RED problem. And where is the trigger located? Right? Is it at the corner or is it at the center of the image? And, and the third question is, um, what's the target label? And, and whether or not we are able to, what's the target of clean label? So are, are we able to reverse engineer? Uh, this is the poison training uh, samples. So uh, here I show some uh, 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 recent works along this direction. And I'll give you an overview about this. Uh, this is uh, uh, RED uh, problems for the backdoor attacks. Uh, here I mainly focus on the estimation of the backdoor triggers because it involves both. You have to estimate a trigger pattern as well as trigger local, uh, location. And, and, and this as examples. So the one of the earliest work is from Wang at uh, 2019. Um, the basic, you're just are trying to uh, formulate this as a trigger estimation problem as a sparse alternation problem. So assume you have image and you use, you, you introduce two variables. The first variable is M. M is the, is the mask trying to, uh, trying to identify the location of the trigger. M is a trigger mask. You can think about if the entry in M is one, that means the trigger is present. If the, uh, the entry in M is zero, that means the pixel in the triggers is not present in this image. So this is just a mask over the image. And the second variables that they introduced is a perturbation variable. It's very similar to that result perturbation. You introduce a perturbations and delta is actually trying to encode the trigger pattern, okay? So now the perturbed training samples, you can um, write this as the following. X prime is the perturbed training samples. It's given by, the unperturbed part, one minus m times x, x is the original training samples, plus m times delta. I'm trying to tell you the location of the trigger and delta trying to tell you the content of the trigger. So this is just uh, 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 reformulations. So now given this, uh, they can formulate a sparse alternation problem to learn the m and delta simultaneously. So once it's successful, then you can identify the trigger location, trigger pattern, or, or trigger, trigger content. Uh, for some very simple backdoor triggers, like the square we mentioned in our slides, using this measure, you are able to recover the triggers. Um, this is original trigger and this is recover triggers, using their measure. But however, for some complex triggers, like watermarking patterns, it's, it's not able to, uh, to recover the trigger precisely. It's not surprising because the performance of the trigger estimation in their approach is built upon the sparse alternation. You have to assume sparsity. So in the first example, the trigger is just a small portion of the pixel. It obeys the sparsity. But for the second examples, the watermarking patterns, it appears almost everywhere in the image. There's no sparsity assumption. So that's why this measure does not work very well. However, it gives us a clue about at least we are able to reverse engineer. So this is a Trojan or backdoor triggers from the poison model, uh, from the poison model. This, so this is a good sample. So therefore, um, there are some um, uh, follow-up works trying to uh, make this is a, a, a trigger estimation um, a problem um, uh, resolved uh, in a better way. So uh, here I introduced two works. The one of the works is trying to advance this is a sparse uh, regularization term. Uh, instead of using this L1 sparsity term, uh, they, they are using the elastic norm. And they show that if that happens, then the trigger estimation becomes better. Again, it's not perfect, but uh, it's better compared to uh, uh, the, the, the Wang's work in 2019. And later on, another work um, which called DFTND, uh, they are trying to 
general, generalize these trigger estimation problems to a data free regime. What does it mean? This means this means X, X here you consider to recover trigger can be a random noise image. So they found that even though you use X as a random noise, but you are still able to recover some trigger pattern. But again, it's not, still not perfect. They uh, they can recognize some uh, trigger patterns here, but, but since the original image is random noise, um, therefore the performance is not as good as the impartation, right? But the good side for this work is is a, is enables trigger estimation in a data free regime. You don't need to know the training data. You don't need to know the test data. You only you can just uh, are using random input, and now you are able to reverse near some trigger patterns. And and in two thousand in uh, in twenty twenty, uh, there's another work from the Zico's group. Uh, um, they show that, uh, in fact, the precise recovery of the trigger is not necessary. You you can recover many trigger candidates. Um, here um, they have different color patterns. But once you do this reverse engineering, uh, even though there's uh, so many trigger candidates. But either of them is a successful trigger uh, to backdoor the original model. So basically they said, um, even though the original triggers is unique, like this pattern, even though the original trigger is unique, but from the reverse engineering perspective, the reverse engineered triggers can be diverse. They could have different color patterns, but if you try these triggers to repoison the models, there's Every of the triggers is being a successful backdoor trigger. So this is a paper shows that precise backdoor reverse engineer may not be necessary. Um, so this is good stuff for us as well because we can relax the trigger estimation assumptions. We don't have to recover the trigger in a very precise way. Um, but again, uh, this is the work also based on some assumptions. But if, I, if you are interested, you can take a look at it. And very recently, there's another uh, work trying to recover these uh, trigger patterns, but what they call it is a, is a cognitive pattern. They want to use this as a recovered trigger pattern to help backdoor model detection. So as you can see, the end here is the, actually the trigger mask as we introduced early, the same thing, but what they recall is a cognitive pattern. So why they want to reverse engineer this trigger pattern? Because they found that using this as an app, even though it's not precise, but it can help us to detect backdoor models. How to build up the detector? They just use the norm of this is M. M is a mask, is a sparse mask, remember? And you can consider the power of the M, the L1 norm of the M uh, as the detection, uh, as, a, as a backdoor model detector. If the model is a clean model, um, then this is a recovered M, uh, we will have a larger L1 norm. But if the model is a backdoor model in the right, then the L1 norm is typically small. So this is a called a shortcut phenomenon. If the model is backdoor, then the recovered M typically has a small energy because there exists a shortcut in the backdoor model. So they, they use this phenomenon to detect which model is a backdoor. So this is a, another examples to use this reverse engineered trigger to help us uh, to do the model uh, backdoor model detection. Okay, um, here I just give a quick overview about this is uh, uh, RED for the backdoor attacks. Uh, and, and, and at the end, I want to summarize uh, this part a little bit. So existing works uh, mostly focus on the RED problem for the backdoor trigger recovery. So this is a mainstream. And why? Because uh, having the backdoor triggers, then you can do many things. Backdoor attack, backdoor model detection, and also uh, you can localize the trigger content and you can do the model and data cleans. For example, you can cut out these regions and retrain the model, so on and so forth. Um, but uh, the existing works uh, only shows uh, RED for the backdoor attacks works for a single backdoor trigger, like square. If the backdoor trigger is very complex, then um, uh, this, is a, this is still a very challenging task for the RED. And uh, another uh, interesting uh, note I want to point out is probably a uh, precise recovery of the triggers is not uh, necessary, right? Uh, although it's difficult, but it's not necessary. Um, the last two of them show that. You do have to precisely recover the trigger. You can only use the set information, like L1 norm of the app to do the backdoor model detection. 
And lastly, uh, um, um, the reverse engineered triggers have been used um, for the backdoor detection, as I mentioned. Okay, um, I think that's the uh, second part. Uh, we, ask, we, we can have the 10 minutes break uh, or five minutes break and that uh, Xiaoming will, uh, let, yeah, let's uh, have a five minute break because uh, 11, uh, uh, 15 now. So now you can come back and then we will finish this tutorial. Um, for the third part, we will talk about RED for the human structural attacks for the genetic models. Thanks. By the way, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, so version seven? Yeah, version eight now. Version eight now? Yeah. Oh, okay, you can do that. Yeah, sure. Okay. Hey, so yeah. I'll ask the same question again, or the slight adjustment. Yes. Um, so you answered previously about physical attacks with respect to the um, activation estimate. Mm -hmm. And the whole, yeah, there are challenges there. But same thing, but for um, the model. I guess what did you call it, model parsing? Yeah. Um, do you think it would be easier or harder with yeah, respect to model parsing? I think it would be easier. Right. So that's what I expected. Um, because, I mean, there's just more to work with, right? So, okay. And then all of these results are classification problems. How do you think it would, or what is your intuition of how it would happen to the other detectors um, as opposed to Sure. Essentially, you would just be using, or what all of your results relate to your yeah. back yeah. um, yes. um, How does it? Um, it could be easier to do this because um, if you consider uh, if the detection network itself, um, you guard people who run the plastic network, it would be easier to do this because it's only a little bit of a plastic network. But if you consider the detection time, all Right. That is really more difficult. You know, you have to be able to share the best of the network. Right. 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 然后他也问我关于租房呀、啊、这种事情，是个女生，嗯，没有问题了，该做的。对大佬，对那个专门做百度的普普通老师，对。就是我也比较一个，就是你刚才说你帮忙，他做他的一个事情，比较有意思，就是比如说，不是啊，对，就是你说的，就是你你，或者比如说，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，对，我觉得这样的话，因为这个这个 value 的 cost 也相对是低的。我们这边也有听说，就是说，呃，像您刚才说讲的，比如说你知道一些在做的东西，然后你对这些来说，你懂，你这个就是简单的。但问题是，为什么你怎么自己知道它？因为就可能，比如说，因为我我说这个我不知道，我说现在所有，就我现在讨论所有的东西，现在都是从 model。就是你，你只知道大家在做什么，或者是一些不同的，你也可以
Where's my room? All right, let's get started. So I'll be talking about uh, part three of the tutorial. Uh, I'll be focused on human central attacks. Um, so I think uh, Sujia have uh, given us a nice overview about uh, you know why we need to do in RED, right, reverse engineering. Now let's talk about uh, for uh, for for human central attacks. You know why do we need to do it? Well, a lot of attack uh, people have malicious purposes, right? People want to modify the image or video content and try to convey some message. So therefore, there has been different kind of you know attacks or modification on image data, such as you know season based attack, either using GAN, VE, different models. And uh, there's also don't forget there's also classic image forgery, right? Such as you take two images, you want to do copy and paste, right? You want to do images spreading, you also want to you know morphing facial images. So these are very classic, not involving anything else, right? Those should be detected as well. Don't forget those classic uh, sort of attacks. So in terms of defense on our side, we can see that, uh, you know, if you attack or use some sort of known models, the model has been classically, you know, published, no models. Yes, I'm not sharing the screen, my bad. Oh, yeah. sure, my bad. The, uh, yeah. Room, right? Yeah, I'm sorry. Share it now. Is it recording as well? Oh, yeah, it's recording. Okay. And let's start showing. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if it's a known attack, right? So then uh, as a defender, we can either do say image attribution or model attribution, basically try to classify which one of the model was initially attacked. Or I can localize what portion of the image has been modified called manipulation localization, right? Now, what if it's unknown models? People, you know, pretty smart, modify these models, train a new model, use a new model to do attack. So in that case, those previous image attribution as well as image manipulation localization may not work because I've never seen that, that kind of model in my training process. So in that case, we'll be doing so-called model parsing, okay? Uh, so therefore, for my part, I'm going to cover, uh, I would say, uh, three topics, uh, starting from model parsing to manipulation detection, which is mostly uh, binary uh, detection, yes or no, fake or real, and the manipulation localization generate a mask to tell you where it has been modified. And with each one of them, we have a more detailed kind of uh, um, sort of algorithms. Now, before we start, let's try, try to uh, you know give credit to the previous researcher in this field to see what kind of problem has been has been studied uh, in this uh, relative topics. So there has been a few uh, previous work in terms of ID reverse engineering. And for example, the first work mostly is trying to do a classification, for example, classify whether FFHQ, which database has been used in trend models, or it has been doing classified model architecture, whether ResNet 50, ResNet 18, you know, so on and so forth. But it doesn't go ahead and estimate the architectures of a particular network, okay? Uh, the second one is typically using, uh, you know, assuming you have the white box mo uh, models and you're actually, as actually estimating the training parameters, such as what is step size, what's the learning rate, and so, so those parameters you're trying to estimate. Okay. 
Uh, the last one tried to use additional information such as what is the GPU consumption, so what, what is uh, you know, uh, uh, memory leakage information. You use those hardware information to help you to do IED, basically. Uh, while in our case, we only want to take the synthetic generated image, the photo as the only information to do IED. Okay. Uh, previously, in terms of detection, uh, you know, uh, defake has been a pretty long topic. There's been many, 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 many previous work in this uh, in this topic, and uh, um, usually people deal with either one or different kind of manipulation types, and each image ha can have its own kind of manipulation areas. And uh, one of the work uh, was coming from my group that we're trying to have one method that can deal with multiple manipulation types. And uh, which including, for example, here we have expression manipulation and idea manipulation and uh, attribute manipulation and so on and so forth. And uh, one of the findings in previous work is that, uh, you know, seeing based since the image is um, uh, not only about the facial, but there are also other images that you can manipulate, right? Any images. And usually, um, for example, this work from uh, Alosha's group in UC Berkeley, they're trying to propose one unified detector that can detect the you know, images that can uh, generate from, from 11 different unseen architectures. So people are, care very much about uh, unseen model uh, generated image detections, right? So the training uh, model and the testing model that come from different GM generated models. Um, other findings in terms of previous work is that uh, indeed there's different kind of artifacts in the CNN general images. Those artifacts are very much visible if you bring, uh, if you visualize images in the high frequency domain. For example, on the left hand side, these are showing you for different game models, they actually have a particular high frequency patterns. And those patterns are very important for doing your detection jobs, right? And this idea actually coming from, is learning from the hardware um, um, image processing communities. Image processing community, there's one problem called image forensic meaning that if I have a cell phone capture data from that image, I can try to estimate which cell phone, whether iPhone or Samsung phone capture that data. Why? Because any CCD sensors will leave some fingerprint on the capture images. Those images can allow you to do forensics basically. Okay, same idea. So the GM is kind of equivalent to CCD sensors, right? Because the general model produces photo just like the camera CCD take pictures. So from those, you can actually estimate uh, um, um, which model uh, generated the data, okay? Um, so because of that, it's common for uh, a lot of detection method to leverage the information in the frequency domain. So you can see the previous method trying to take an image, uh, generate FFT representation and from that representation, then you can learn a model to do the uh, detection, okay? Now, uh, switch gear from detection to localization, okay? In the localization, uh, most of the methods that are trying to generate uh, the uh, so-called the sedimentation mass in a relatively lower resolution. Suppose my image is, let's say 200 by 200. My generated mass is probably only 40 by 40. So it's not as high quality as the original input image is. Ideally, you should you know, produce the same size images, right? For your localization results. Um, so that's one. And uh, uh, secondly, is that uh, previous method is also very particular to uh, to, a, uh, to a manipulation type. For example, you see a lot of paper only dealing with the localization for scene based method. You can see a lot of paper only dealing with the classical method, such as image splicing. So there has been not, not been many work trying to combine both in one approach. Okay. Um, so this approach is one example. This is one of the previous work uh, from my group. We're trying to do the uh, uh, image manipulation organization, uh, mostly for classical kind of image editing, such as image, uh, image, uh, image splicing. Okay, so in summary, uh, the previous method uh, basically require access to the either the model or their input, basically additional information compared to the image itself. And uh, um, they are very special, specialized in terms of either CNN or the classic kind of editing method, right? So therefore in this tutorial, we want to cover method, right? That can only starting from the image that estimates the model hyperparameter. That's number one, I will be covering. Uh, number two, we like to have a unified approach that can handle both scene based editing as well as classical image editing, okay? Uh, finally, we're also briefly touching about uh, how do you do this in a proactive way instead of passive way to do the uh, manipulation detection, okay? 
So with that, let me start with a part one of my part called model parsing, okay? So uh, we know that classically we can do binary detection or multi-class image attribution. This is a very classic problem, okay? Now, what if attacker using an unknown model to generate the data, right? So in that case, you know, unfortunately, your classical method will not work well on this, uh, you know, unknown model generated data. So what we propose to do is that what if you do model parsing, right? You do starting from the image you, you are receiving from the unknown model, you go through your IED model, then you go ahead and estimate what kind of architecture of the unknown model people are using, such as how many layers, what is kernel size, where the skip connection was used. You can define a set of hyperparameters that describe architecture, and you, your job is trying to estimate those parameters, okay? Uh, of course, this is not an easy job. So one approach we're trying to see that, that can we define some latent descriptions, we call, we call this as a feature vector that indicative of the architectures. So with that feature representation, you can, the benefit is that, is that it become intermediate representation. You can do things like, uh, you know, uh, coordinate mason information attacking and indexing as well as attribution defect detection. So it become an intermediate representation for you to do allow to, for you to do multiple tasks. So you may wondering what is called for misinformation attack. So for example, right, suppose uh, in US we have a few medium, you know, um, big media companies. For example, this is uh, Los Angeles time. Suppose a certain time Sunday, it receives some news, you know, um, uploading from news group. Uh, later on Sunday, you see another one and this is, um, uh, a different time, uh, you also receive another news groups. So if you have multiple kind of news articles, uh, if you go through the uh, defect detection algorithm, you may say, okay, these are all, let's say, fakes, right? And then you go through the model attribution method, it may tell you that this is some sort of the um, unknown model, unfortunately, because this model I have never seen before. So therefore, from a forensic perspective, one natural question we're asking is that, is this a coordinated misinformation attack? Are these three attackers coming from the same person to launch this attack? Okay, so that's a valuable information to answer, right? Now, how do we answer that question? Uh, well, ideally, if let's say for different models, if we don't treat them as discrete class, I call this model one to model 10, there's these are different uh, generating model, okay, big gain and so on and so forth. Classically, they are just different models, one, two, three, four, and two, and two 10, right? 10 different models. But ideally in our case, what if I can project them into a latent space so that if the two models are relatively similar to each other, they will be closer to each other in the latent space. Now this is a continuous space, right? Then the benefit is that if I have the three unknown model from previous slide, I can also project them into the space. If they happens to be very close to each other in that space, now I know they are most likely is the, come from the same attacker. So that's a motivation. Okay, all right. So in summary, uh, the goal of this line of research is to say that, uh, you know, I start with some uh, network hyperparameters such as number of layers, uh, number of parameters, upsampling and so on and so forth, together with the loss functions, right? With those hyperparameters, I can generate uh, a GM, so-called the generating models. And with the model, I produce some fake images, right? And with both images, I, I will do a fingerprint estimation network uh, given the fingerprint, which is my essentially my intermediate representation, I can do things like um, image uh, image attribution and uh, as well as model passing. Now the model passing allow me to start with the image, start with this uh, uh, fingerprint estimation network. Eventually, go ahead to recover those parameters. Okay, because those parameters are essential in terms of in terms of defining a GN. Okay, so that's the RED problem. Um, definition. So why we do, uh, do we need to do this? Well, um, uh, we want to place discrete model into a continuous space, as I mentioned, right? And we want to somehow basically quantify the, 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 the sort of GMs. So we want to handle the attack from the unknown models. And uh, um, also we want to defend against coordinated uh, misinformation attacks. Okay, so um, research always start with database because the vision is 
you know, driven by a data set. So therefore we spent quite some effort in collecting database. Um, so my student, he uh, take a lot of different uh, uh, GMs. For every GM, he either take an input image or run the noise as input to the GM and produce a thousand image per GMs. Um, then for each one of the model, he kind of the, uh, keep a note on the ground truth, right? He used 15 dimensional parameter to define the model architectures. And he also used the 10 dimensional feature vector to define the, what loss function was used to train the GMs. Okay, so these are the parameterization basically of the problem of the space he want to explore. And then he eventually collected about 116 different GMs. So, so fairly larger uh, data set. Uh, he went through pr probably pr the previous four or five years on all the GMs, whoever people have released code release model, he collects them. Okay, so these are kind of the distribution of the GM he has covered. You can see there's a big chunk is a GAN model because GAN was you know, very popular, um, but he used other models, autoregression model, VAE models, and the AA models. I believe the latest work we also have diffusion models because diffusion model is is quite uh, you know popular right now. And in terms of content, you can see that not only we have face, but we also have others, MNIST and CIFAR ten. So quite a diverse kind of content we're dealing with. And the finally is image resolution from small image to large images. You will cover different resolutions. Okay. Uh, in terms of parameters, so this show you an uh, example of what parameter we're dealing with. So these are so-called the uh, network architecture parameter, describe the architectures. We have both continuous parameters, such as number of layers, number of convolutional layers, polyconnect layers, poly and so on and so forth, okay? We also have the descriptor, descriptor parameter, which is more like a yes or no or multiple selections, uh, such as where the skip connection is used, right, upsampling types, these are all discrete, okay? In terms of loss functions, uh, we have 10 dimensional. These are the possible loss terms uh, people ever use in training a GM, right? Suppose I have one game model utilize both L1 uh, plus MSC uh, plus least the square, then I'm just saying that one, one, zero, one. So it's kind of the one hot vector or multi hot vector indicator which uh, loss function was used. Okay, so set up the database and uh, um, the parameterization. Let's see what's the idea. You know how we how do we actually do this estimation problem? Uh, one idea we had is this so-called the class wing. Um, the idea is very simple. Basically, is that directly estimated those parameters are very hard to do, right? But what if you take the one one six trying to group them into different clusters? And estimating the center of the cluster is relatively easy because that's a classification problem, right? If you have 10 different clusters. Once you're able to estimate center, now the next step is to estimate the deviation. Basically how much deviate your particular GM is coming from away from the center. So we make this as a two-step kind of process. Um, so with that, you can see that this U5, U3, mu 4 these are basically the center we're estimating the cluster center and the amount of deviation we are doing for every testing GMs, okay? So this is a high level idea. Um, so therefore to make this happen, we take all the GM as input to do, uh, to take the 15 plus 10, that's 25 dimensional parameter. We do clustering, k-min, and they get different clusters, okay? Now, how do we get ground truth? Well, uh, we have two different types, continuous type or discrete type, right? Uh, for continuous type, you can see that at class level, it basically the mean of the continuous value, very simple. And for instance, it's basically how much deviation you're compared to the mean, okay? So that's the ground truth for the continuous. Now, this grid is a bit tricky because this grid, you don't really have the mean, right? So because upsampling type, let's say 2.5 doesn't mean anything. Right, so therefore, uh, the class level we are using majority voting uh, as indication for that cluster, uh, while for the instant level we are doing the extra class classification. Okay. All right. So this is a high level framework of the approach. Um, you can see that on the left hand side we have uh, the fingerprint estimation network. Then on the right hand side we do the clustering. Basically, the, on the top we estimate the which cluster. On the bottom, we estimate which, uh, how much deviation you have compared to the cluster. Okay, so uh, in terms of evaluation, uh, you can see that 
we have uh, uh, four different test sets. Each test set has 12 different GMs, and we're trying to make them to be balanced, okay? We have performance metric we use for, uh, for continuous parameter, discrete parameter, we have different uh, you know, evaluation metrics. Um, so let's look at some results. Okay, so this is a uh, result indicate that for different uh, parameters, these are continuous parameters, how much L1 error in our estimation? Okay, so therefore the lower the better. Yeah, we also have a standard deviation. The standard deviation, if it's small, it means that the estimation is very stable across four different test sets. Okay, so you can see that for some uh, parameters, such as the uh, number of polling layer, number of parameters, they are relatively accurate compared to other parameters because this parameter we can better estimate. Those parameters, we are not that great. What does that mean? It means that different hyperparameters have different footprint in the final general images. The correlation is some parameters have strong correlation, some parameters have weaker correlations. Okay, that's a very important information. So it looks like the polling is quite detectable, basically, right? How many polling you're using in the network? But other parameters, for example, such as those parameters, how many filters and those things are relatively harder to be estimated, okay? And this is the network architecture for the discrete type, okay? Um, uh, same thing. Uh, so these are the relatively easy to be estimated, while those are relatively easy to be estimated. And these are numerical numbers. Um, I don't think we have time to go through the details. Um, same thing with the loss functions. Um, so we find that, you know, uh, this uh, hinge loss and the MMD loss is relatively easy to be estimated. And this F1 score, the higher the better. Okay. All right. So this is the so called the fingerprint we're estimating for 116 different GMs. Okay. So that's a spatial domain fingerprint. This is a frequency domain fingerprint. This is very much similar, uh, as I said. Uh, every GM, like every cell phone CCD, has a biometric sig signature. And this is their signatures. Okay. This is the reason we can do model attribution or image attribution to say which model produced a GM. And this is an interesting plot to show that what is the correlation between the fingerprint that we estimated for the 116 different GMs. So you can see that, uh, um, uh, that we have certain groups, for example, these few groups, oops, these few groups, they are relatively, uh, their corresponding uh, you know, correlation is relatively high. Uh, you almost see a sub matrices within the big matrix. Why? because they are like the cousins. They are kind of the, the similar model with a few changes. Therefore, their corresponding fingerprint is relatively similar to each other, okay? So I like this uh, figure in the sense that because eventually, as you can see, GM is be being produced every day, every week on archive, right? When the new GM comes, we as a researcher want to say something about how this new GM is being relevant to whatever existing GMs we have so many in the, in the, in the research field, right? So therefore putting all the GM into continuous space so they can do that kind of evaluation, find out who's the cousin, you know, who's the relatives, uh, who's your siblings. Those are in, important information to understand the new GMs, okay? Um, so I think this is the kind of paved way to go to that direction. Okay, so uh, I mentioned this quality mission from an attack. We actually evaluated this. So therefore, if you have two different um, uh, unknown images, you want to say that whether it come from two different GM, GM1 or GM2, or you come from the same GM, you know? Um, so therefore to formulate this problem, we take the 116, we bring them in a separate into training, but a testing set, you can test instead some of uh, 15 are seen, 15 are unseen, right, They're both. And then we're given two tests. We go ahead, uh, estimate the model hyperparameter. So this is 10 plus 15, 25 dimensional parameter. And then we compute the cosine similarities, okay? And eventually you can see that uh, we have achieving the classification accuracy of 71%. So it's not totally flip a coin. It's not random guess. So there's still some information you can utilize to do this uh, um, coordinated misinformation attack, okay? All right, so with that, let me move to model parsing number two. Uh, I'm talking about a, a, a little bit new method that we are doing in the space. Uh, I guess I'm a little bit short of time. Probably I will go a little bit faster in this. Uh, so in this part, the problem setup is the same. We want to estimate 
model hyperparameters, okay? But the new things we are doing here is that we want to understand what is the correlation between different hyperparameters, okay? So therefore, you can see that by taking 116 different GMs, we're trying to understand what is correlation between different, uh, uh, so every, every row, every column is different hyperparameters. And the value is indicate the correlation of those hyperparameters. So based on the correlation, we set up threshold and convert them into a binary map. Now, why we do this? Because a binary map can be converted into a graph. Okay, that's the reason we do it. So we want to use this graph representation to learn the correlation among the hyperparameters, which will help us to do the estimation for any unknown models. So that's the incentive here. Okay. So with that, um, uh, some details, for example, we generate a model, we have a hyperparameter, we convert the continuous one into different bracket, and this will allow us to build a graph. And, but we know that eventually we still need to estimate continuous one, right? So therefore we normalize them into a, into a, into a value such as floating number 0 0.64, for example, for number, uh, number parameter equal to 30 million, for example. And with that, uh, the benefit is that we can do this uh, kind of stage by stage. We do this in two stages, okay? Um, so the different color indicate either continuous or discrete. And as I said, we uh, uh, use this one half vector to, to indicate uh, the discrete as well as continuous. And then finally, we convert them into a uh, continuous values. So in actual training stage, okay, we, um, having a network getting feature vectors, then uh, the baseline will just directly, directly estimate uh, the one half vectors. But in our case, we have graphic uh, graph convolutional network, um, this GCN refinement to basically refine the uh, GCN uh, eventually to do a better job. And then in stage two, we do a, uh, a kind of linear layer based regressions. Okay, so this is how we train the model. And during testing time, we basically do the same thing. As you can see, testing, we do this GCN, and then eventually uh, for the continuous parameter, we do a, 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 a linear network. Okay, so what is the GCN to do here? GCN, as you can imagine, is basically that you have some um, graph network, you're trying to do convolution as well as, uh, you, can, you want to do graph pooling as well as unpooling. So the graph pooling basically allow you to assemble information from neighboring graph into a super node and then carry information over. So these are the mathematical representation. Eventually it's a matrix multiplication for you to do this graph pooling. And then after a few layers, we were doing the unpooling. So to recover the original information basically, okay? Um, so with this, uh, what you see is that uh, uh, in terms of all the pattern performance, for example, here, the FEN was the previous paper I introduced, uh, you know, five minutes ago. And these are the new work, either GCN without polling or GCN with a, uh, with a polling. You can see that GCN with a polling does have better performance compared to the previous uh, method. Okay, so why this method works? Well, for example, this is the, um, what we're showing is the, um, the average cosine similarity of 2,000 pairs of uh, uh, generated correlation graph we have from our method. Uh, you can see that the diagonal element shows that if I have two images come from the same GM, they have highly similar um, graph correlation, which is a matrix A, okay? Um, similarly, we also found that uh, this graph correlation is also highly relevant, highly correlated with the uh, performance. So for example, the blue one, right, is, uh, is the cosine similarity of the correlation graph, while the yellow one is actually the performance we have in terms of parameter estimation. You can see that this two is highly correlated, right? Uh, in other words, for every model, every GM, if they have higher correlation in the matrix A, in the correlation graph, they will also eventually have higher uh, parameter estimation performance. Okay, so with that, let's move to the manipulation detection uh, part, okay? Um, so as I said, the goal here is trying to do image forgery detection and the localization uh, while 
giving either CNN since the image or image editing, we should have a single model will perform number one detection, number two, localize which pixel has been modified. Okay. And uh, uh, this, of course, is pretty challenging task because previous method has been mostly focused on one of the two types uh, only. Okay. Now, how do we do this? Uh, well, we're trying to say that, uh, can we try to interpret the image attribution, uh, a photo attribute of every image in terms of different uh, levels? For example, this is one example, right? In level one, we're trying to say that whether it's fully synthesized versus a partial manipulation, right? In level two, we want to say that whether it's diffusion model or GAN or classic image editing. Level three, we're trying to say that if it's diffusion model, whether it's conditional diffusion or unconditional diffusion, okay? In level four, we're trying to talk about what's the particular GN that was used to, to generate that model. So you can see that we're almost taking different kind of generative model as well editing into a groups, okay? We feel that this kind of hierarchical or grouping will allow us to better estimate different GNs. Think about, especially when you're dealing with unknown models, because for unknown model, models, you may you may have one more node in the level four, right? Let's call it the unknown. But this unknown model will be still be belong to the diffusion model, belong to GAN, belong to editing. So you can still find a parent node that can describe the unknown models. So that's really the benefit, okay? So we feel that this is a kind of necessary if you go to the regime of dealing with unknown model-based uh, kind of manipulation detection. Okay, um, so with this, you can see that the, the, the detailed architecture will be that, you know, giving an image, we do four level estimation, right? We, for every image, we trying to class them, not only the last level, which is what you are really interested, but also even in the intermediate top levels, okay? And, uh, um, uh, yep, let me show you the architecture, I think. Maybe this is the best slide. Yeah. So giving image, we uh, one block dealing with RGB, another block dealing with the frequency component. Okay. Then we concatenate both the two blocks. Um, so this is kind of the multi-branch feature extractor will extract the feature for you to do a classification in four different levels, level one to level four. Okay. Um, that's why we call this hi-fi net heretical kind of uh, network. And this is driven by the four level design in the beginning. And uh, we had some uh, new um, element in the algorithm uh, in terms of how we deal with masks and how we do the localization, okay? Um, so one of them is trying to say that we define loss function so that, you know, if it's the real data, we want them to be uh, concentrated or close to, close to each other as much as possible. If it's a forgery data, we want them to be away from the center in the latent space, okay? So indeed, if you eventually look at the distribution of, you know, different real or fakes, you can see they are actually can be separated among each other. And another one we do is called partial convolution. So typical convolution, you will be convolved with any single pixels. But when you're trying to uh, deal with masks, so it's important that when you do convolution, you kind of skip the mask areas. So we call this as a mask convolution. So this does uh, help the performance. Uh, so you can see that whenever you have those patches, you do convolution, you try to ignore the black pixels, uh, only use the uh, foreground area. Okay, uh, to do this work, we're also collecting a very large database, uh, including all the different types. Uh, so it's mostly a sample of existing database, but we're also including images from um, diffusion and uh, even mid journey. Mid journey is uh, you know, one of the latest generated model. Uh, those images, we also do testing on those data, okay? Okay, performance-wise, uh, as you can see, we compare with the previous one method in both the detection and localization, and the performance has been quite well. And uh, these, again, these are the FFT for different uh, uh, generative models, including diffusion model. Uh, you can see that they still have uh, dedicated patterns um, for us to be, to be able to do uh, detection. And uh, um, these are the visualization for the uh, localization um, performance. Um, 
this is still a very hard problem, okay, by the way. Uh, being able to very accurately localize the modified area is not an easy problem, especially some of modification area can be very small compared to the entire pixel, okay? It's like the children detection uh, Sija was mentioning. So for any tiny modification areas, it's not easy to detect. Uh, still, this is the ongoing research, okay? Okay, due to time, let me mo quickly move to the last part. Hopefully I can do it within less than 10 minutes, uh, five minutes. All right, so, so far what we have been talking about is called the um, proactive uh, passive method, meaning that someone, you know, take the GM, generate images, right? And then give to our algorithms, I mean, maybe algorithms, we say it's real or fake. We call this the passive method. The algorithm takes the data as input, just go ahead, process it and give back to you, okay? Now, what we have been doing is also a proactive method, meaning that if the image are in my hand, can I add some encryptions, doing some protections? So in our case, we're essentially adding some signal to the data and we're getting a new image, right? Uh, if this is a kind of the low magnitude, so then your uh, image domain, you don't see much difference. It's almost the same image, but it's already adding some signal to it. Now, if someone takes that image to apply GM to, GM, to do any modifications, then we are saying that this image will be much easier to do classification, to do manipulation detection because of our protection here, right here, okay? So therefore the question is that what kind of signal you should be learning so that you can make the detection of this kind of content to be much easier, especially for unknown manipulations. So that's a question we answer here, okay? So you can imagine, this itself is sort of a, a, a adversarial attack, right? We are attacked, we are as a defender, we attack image first. After attacking, if someone, right, further doing any attack, it will be much easier to be detected. So that's the purpose, okay? And uh, um, I will skip the detail on how we do it. Uh, but the high level message is that uh, compared to the work from, I think this is uh, Alosha Group's paper, uh, by training model on one GM, but testing on many, many different GMs, you can see that overall the generation ability is 92 versus uh, uh, 82. So uh, this method is much more generalizable to unseen model attacks. That's a high level um, message. Um, in this, uh, this is a previous year. So in this year's CVPR, we take one step further, that is, how do we do this kind of localization? Meaning that uh, uh, proactive method is not only helping detection, that's previous last year's CPR. This year we showed that it can also help localization, okay? Better localize and modify area. So it's the same idea basically, yeah. Um, so this is the previous method and this is what we do. We add some signal to the data, we got a new image. So if some GM modifies the data, then we can better localize which pixel has been modified. Okay. Okay, I will complete it right here. So in summary, uh, we basically show you that uh, um, uh, IED is an interesting problem. There's still a lot of research to be done and uh, um, trying to have one approach that works for both classic as well as season based modification is kind of important thing to do. And there might be some interesting to going on in terms of the uh, proactive manipulation detection, meaning that added some, added some signal so that any modification will be much easier to be detected. Okay, so I think there's a few other slides. Maybe Sucha can conclude it. Yeah. Okay, okay uh, I will use uh, five minutes uh, to uh, conclude this uh, tutorial. Uh, a quick summary. Uh, I think the key message we want to deliver is what's RED. Hopefully you understand. Okay, RED trying to um, delve into the attack instances and to infer some fine green to attack information. Okay, and um, we consider uh, both machine centric and human centric attacks. And there's a different RED problems, and but um, you can all understand this is a kind of like a reverse engineering process. Okay. And, and and there's a, a Twitter page. And if you're interested on this topic, you can find uh, our slides and as well as uh, some um, uh, relevant and highlighted references. 
Um, okay, some open questions. Uh, let me list uh, some open questions that, that can inspire us to think about how to further advance this field and also how to connect uh, our own works. So for example, um, there's still uh, quite room to, to think about how to estimate um, perturbations of non-LP attacks. Um, well, it become, could become more challenging because um, you will lose this is uh, LP constraint. LP constraint basically saying, okay, there, there exists some certain, sparse, certain sparsity structures. And also uh, there could, um, we could think about how to do the new attacks, right? To full reverse engineer. So um, no one um, really uh, uh, tap into this is a, a new adversarial uh, uh, attack generation uh, uh, um, um, scenario. And also how to leverage RED to further advance um, existing adversarial defenses. For example, one key properties from the right, from the reverse engineering process is it provides us some explanation merit. So it will explain, okay, how they should attack, how they should uh, see inside images, uh, 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 trace backing to the generation models, to trace backing to the victim models. Um, how can we leverage this is uh, interpretability merit to further advance this uh, adversarial defenses techniques? And how to improve this is auto distribution performance of the right across the diverse attack uh, types and so on and so forth. And um, what else attack tools should be considered for, for, for the right? Um, and, and further, uh, how to categorize or contrast uh, various uh, uh, generative models and how to uh, make the RD uh, framework approach itself more interpretable. And, and so this is all uh, good questions that we can ask. And further, I want to give another uh, um, uh, generic views about this uh, right process. So it's a model, in, a model data model inference viewpoint. So you can, you can think about the reverse engineering process, um, which connects data inference, like I don't samples of data poisons, so on so forth, with model inference, right? Uh, with the victim models or backdoor models, and so on and so forth. So a possible the data model inference analysis framework that can be distilled uh, from the uh, from right is, let's start from the pre-trained foundation models. Any models, uh, image classification models, generative models, so on and so forth. So one thing is you want to do some inverse process. You know, think about the model inversion process. Actually, there are some model inversion attacks, but here, uh, based on very similar favor, but here we were trying to um, do the reverse engineering to help us to define the attacks. Okay, so once you have the reverse engineering process, you can uh, do the model inversion. And now what do you will get? You will get some data inference. You, will, you, you, you can trace back to the bad data points, right? So like data points in the one of examples, you can identify those harmful data points. So from the model, and to reverse engineer some data properties or even some um, model properties behind the data properties. That also possible, like uh, the model passing uh, examples. And then once you have this, suppose at the data level, once you identify the bad data, so one thing you can do is think about uh, to improve the original pre foundation model is what? To remove the influence of the bad data points, right? So this process I actually called machine learning. So um, um, I, I, this tutorial, we, we are talking about uh, reverse engineering, trying to understand data model influence. But in fact, we can leverage this as uh, uh, understandings to further improve the models. Um, we change just to trying to remove the bad data influence. So this is, uh, there's a term called machine learning. So um, it, can, it can inspire us to develop uh, many new defenses, right? Uh, defenses against the backdoor attacks, trying to remove this backdoor data point and removing bias data for fairness learning as well, right? And also protecting privacy and the image copyrights for the generation models. So therefore this is a rich field and many open questions that we can answer. Okay, I think that's all for the whole tutorial. And thank you again for attending this tutorial. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, by the way, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, yeah. Okay, um, we're, we're here. Um, we'll talk about. Yeah. Thank you.